from the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. It's the Peach State Classic, and it's next on NBC. Georgia and the Georgia Dome. It's the site of the second annual Peach State Classic as the Aggies of North Carolina A&T take on the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. Hello again, everyone. I'm Charlie Neal, and glad you could join us, and welcome to Atlanta. First of all, this is a season finale for both of these squads, the Aggies and the Bulldogs. But more importantly, it is an opportunity for them to gain bragging rights for the state of South Carolina or North Carolina for the next year. In fact, last year when these two teams met, it was a one-point victory for the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. Will it be that close again this year? Let me bring in my partner, Jay Walker. And, and Jay, you look at these particular teams, and you look at South Carolina, State. They have a new coach this year. Buddy Pugh came in. They started off like they were on fire, five and one. And one reason was the play of Reese McCampbell, the quarterback. And anytime a team gets off to the type of start that these Bulldogs did, you must be getting tremendous play from your quarterback. In this case, Reese McCampbell has led the MEAC in pass efficiency. He's also the leading rusher for this leading rusher for this Bulldog team. Consistency throughout the season with the run and the pass. And for all the disappointments, ups and downs that the Aggies suffered this year, one constant was the play of defensive tackle. Ivan Butler. And you really like Ivan Butler because you saw the, the graphic there. He's got nine sacks. Keep in mind, he's doing this from a defensive tackle position. His first priority is to stop the run, but if you're a quarterback and you're holding on to the football in the pass, he can sack you as well, as those nine sacks indicate. 42nd time that these two teams have met. They know each other well in the kickoff from Atlanta between the Aggies and Bulldogs coming up when we return. We're at the Georgia Dome in Atlanta for the second annual Peach State Classic, the Aggies of North Carolina A&T and the Bulldogs of South Carolina State working down on the sideline as usual. Our right, Nicole Watson, let's go down to Nicole right now. All right, Charlie, thank you very much. This is a rivalry that goes way back, all the way back to 1924. The series record, 20-19-2, with the Bulldogs having a slight edge. Now, both teams are original members of the MEAC, but South Carolina State's Buddy Pugh is in his first year as head coach. He knows a little bit about the rivalry as a player, but he's obviously getting a true taste of things now as a head coach. For Bill Hayes, he's in his 14th season, in his 15th season, and has won four of the last five for the Aggies. The key here, the Aggies have not lost a season finale since 1996. So it's important we'll see who heads north with the Peach State Classic Trophy. Charlie and Jay, back to you. All right, it's going to be very interesting, as you said. As you see, the Bulldogs of South Carolina State in their visiting white jerseys. The Aggies are the home team from North Carolina A&T in this particular contest. There's some confusion on which side of the 50-yard line each team should be uh, when they had the coin toss. Actually, North Carolina A&T won the toss, elected to receive, and South Carolina State is, had elected to defend the goal to our right, and they lined them up in that position, but for whatever reason, they have switched it. Our referee today is uh, Daniel Evans and his crew, and I'm sure we'll get this one away pretty soon. <laughs> Sooner or later, you know, the folks down in the Carolinas can't wait to kick it off here. They're so anxious to get there. They lined up on the wrong side of the field. A little bit of jitterbugs early on uh, by both teams. Anxious to get it going. Ready to hit somebody. Carolina style. And there you see the South Carolina State Bulldogs of course uh, kicking off for them. Guy DiPaolo. Well, maybe DePaulo will not kick off today for South Carolina State. It'll be Brandenburg, the punter, who's going to do the kicking off. And it comes down to Hudgens at the 12. Hudgens across the 15, and he's down at about the... And he stumbles forward somehow to the 35-yard line. How did he get up that far, Jay? That's one of the things that they say. When you ask about him, they say if there's a crack in the defense, he finds a way to expose it. You think he's going down, and he comes out of the pack running. So the Aggies under Jason Douglas will go to work offensively for the first time at their own 35-yard line. Jason getting his first start here as a member of the Aggies, transferred in from San Mateo Junior College, was a second team. Junior College All-American last year where he threw for over 3,000 yards. They're working from the I formation. 
On first down and 10, Hudgens, the second back in the eye, and he has the ball. Hudgens met with opposition soon as he hit the line of scrimmage, and it was Eugene Williams who came up to make the stop defensively. Let's look at the Office Depot, North Carolina A&T backs and receivers. DeBrian Hudgens is the tailback. Akeem Hale, the fullback, the wide receivers are Booker T. Washington, along with Brandon Trusty and Anthony Downing. The offensive line led by Josh Major, a 17-year-old center who's done a fantastic job up there, along with Kareem Sanders, who was a first-team all-conference player as a freshman a year ago. On second and nine. Here's Douglas rolling right, and he throws it, has it complete, up to about the 45, very close to a first down to Booker T. Washington. And Booker T. Washington picks up his 12th reception of the year as we look at the Office Depot defensive alignment for the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. They play a three-down lineman led by Eugene Williams, Javon Hamilton, and Ken Jones getting the start today. He was tied for third coming into the game as far as sacks are concerned in the conference. The linebackers, Johnson, Harrison, and Pooler. And now Hudgens again on the carry with nowhere to go. Maybe lost a half a yard. And the defensive backs for South Carolina State, Chandler, Ellaby, Anthony Gathers, Greg Brown, and Justin Kenley. Well, that was not a third down. That was, uh, I thought he had picked up the first down on the previous play, but that was not uh, the case. And so it brings up a fourth down punting situation. So they drove from their 35, stopped short of the 45, and they're going to have to punt it away. And punting for the Aggies is Yannick Matthews. He's doing all the kicking right now for North Carolina a and and he gets off a pretty good one. From the 15-yard line, Trying to get something going is Goolsby. Leonard Goolsby on the return to Junior from Warner Robins, Georgia. Brings it back from the 15 to the 24. So it's a nine-yard return, and South Carolina State goes to work for the first time. And you saw Goolsby there. You got a lot of Georgia boys on this team here from both of these teams. That's why it's a good location to play the game. A&T recruits heavily in Georgia, and so does South Carolina State. Goolsby gets an opportunity to play in front of his buddies. The stats on Reese McCampbell, those 1,759 yards as a single-season passing record for South Carolina State. It is first and 10 from the shotgun. They go on the end-around play, and it's Burgess trying to get around the corner, and Burgess will not get there. Lost maybe a half a yard on the play. Goes Chris Burgess as we look at the backs and receivers for South Carolina State. Jamie Scott in the backfield. Goolsby Ham. Terrence Metcalf, if that name is familiar. His dad is Terry, brother Eric, and Chris Burgess, the wide receivers. The offensive line, David Aubrey is a good one. Started ever since he's been a freshman at left guard. The brothers, Roderick and Rodriguez at center and right guard, and Bobby Collins is the right tackle. Second down. Single back in the backfield behind the quarterback, McCampbell. And we're going to get a delay of game penalty against... South Carolina State. I think they took a little bit too much time, Jay. Yeah, you know, they got a situation. They're not comfortable Fourth in. The layup ball game on the offense. Let's look at the defense of the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Blackstock, along with Ivan Butler, we spoke of him already. William Hall, that's Paul actually, William Paul and Desmond Wright is a tackle. The linebackers, Sean Jones, Shamar Milton, Maurice Utley, he's a good one. And in the secondary, Curtis Deloach gets to start, along with Jason Horton at the other corner, Montreal Pittman, an academic All-American at free safety. Charles Parham is the strong safety. Play action. McCampbell going deep. Overthrown. Intercepted. By Montreal. No, that's... Not Pittman, that's Deloach. Curtis Deloach with the interception. And for him, that is his first interception of the year. That was overthrown. McCampbell was going deep downfield, but he just overthrew his man. 
So the Aggies of North Carolina A&T get the ball on the first turnover of the ball game, and we'll be back. Today's game is brought to you in part by the Verizon Reads program. We just saw McCampbell throw an interception but that was intercepted by Curtis DeLoach. No score here as we are in the first quarter. Reese McCampbell, that was only the seventh interception he's thrown this year, Jay. And that's what happened. That's why you got those statistics out the window when you play football. On Saturdays, anything can happen as we saw DeLoach step up and make a fantastic interception. Hudgens on the carry, second man through. Hudgens picks up maybe a yard. It'll be second down and nine. I talked to Hudgens yesterday a little bit and said, you know, what he's done. He wasn't really scheduled to play a whole lot this year, but because they weren't getting production from some of the backs that Coach uh, Hayes was counting on this year, he got inserted in the lineup and has come up with some big games, came into the game with 474 yards. And more importantly, he's learning what it's like to play football in the MEAC Conference. Just a freshman, a lot of football ahead of him, so it's going to be an exciting young man in years to come. A little play action, stepping up. Great pass, but a little bit too much lead on it. Trying to get it to Michael Hollingsworth. There's Hollingsworth there out of Shannon, North Carolina. Let's look at the keys to renting brought to you by Verizon for the Aggies. Yeah, and if you're North Carolina A&T, you want to continue to force turnovers. You lead the nations in turnovers. Keep that up. You have to dominate on special teams, not just win, but dominate. And you have to run, run, run. This is the bulldog defense that's susceptible to the running games. We've seen Jay Colbert and T.J. Stallings tear them apart. They've got to establish a running game with Hudgens. On third and long. Douglas wants to throw it. Steps up. Has a man out there. Knocked away. Almost caught on the rebound. Almost did a Franco Harris out there. And that was Hudgens who almost came up with it. <laughs> Hudgens had a little out and up right on the sideline. The ball was not anticipated to go towards him on the deflection. As you see the quarterback do a good job of buying some time here by Douglas. He just unleash the ball upfield. Defender tips the ball right into the hands of Hudgens. Oh, he almost had it. He's a running back, not a wide receiver. But that would have been a fantastic reception and the quarterback would have loved him too. Ellaby was the man who tipped it defensively for South Carolina State and we'll see the second punt of the afternoon by Yannick Matthews and now we've got some movement and even if it's against South Carolina State it still will not give the Aggies enough for the first down because it is fourth and nine. It'll just put them a little closer or push the, them back a little bit. Now let's see if the offense moved or if the defense moved. I know A&T did something. It seemed like they might have moved on the line. I saw an illegal substitution come in there at the last second from the sideline. That guy would have been uncovered if they'd have got away with it. So. <laughs> You're looking at Matthews out of Uniondale, New York. He's the fifth leading punter in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Had a 64-yarder earlier this season. And let's listen to our referee. Got two fouls on the play. Have illegal substitution by the offense. We have a false start by the offense. It's a five-yard penalty. Either way, and there's the illegal substitution. Someone just decided, I need to get in the game. Now, we watch them practice these things, and they, these special teams practice all the time. Why do players have lapses of memory, Jay? You know, you go over time and time again, but you're just not paying attention. You're looking at the scoreboard and looking at your mom and dad in the stands rather than paying attention to the football game, running on late. So the interception so far has not hurt the Bulldogs of South Carolina State as the Aggies with three and out. Fair catch call for and made by Goolsby right at about the 16-yard line. So that's where South Carolina State will get the ball for the second possession of the afternoon. First down and 10 after the punt by Yannick Matthews. Now, South Carolina State's coming to the field. That first series they had, A&T dictated to them what they wanted to do. South Carolina State has to establish that balanced passing attack. Run the ball on the outside, pass the ball on the inside and outside. Look for them to get a little bit more rhythm in their passing attack in this series here. First down and 10. Second possession. And we're in the first quarter. No score, 10-54 remaining. From the shotgun, the handoff. Straight into the line for South Carolina State, and not much running room there. That was on the run for South Carolina State was Maxwell. 
It's looking at Verizon. He's the winning for the Bulldogs. They've got to stop the running game of North Carolina A&T. A&T is going to try to expose them on their runs. They have to have a balanced offensive attack, 50-50 ratio, some pass, some run. You've got a quarterback that can do it and protect the football. This A&T Aggie defense likes to try and create turnovers and force momentum. They can't afford to turn over the football today. And the cornerback, McCampbell, in trouble. And not much going for him. And who was there? Ivan Butler, the man we talked about, who was a junior, char a junior college transfer from Kansas, from West Potomac High in Alexandria, Virginia. And this is what you have to like about him. He's a defensive tackle looking for the run first. But as a quarterback, if you hold it for one second, he's not going to let you get away with that big butler wrapping him up around the ankles on McCampbell. You've got to know where he is every time. He's got nine sacks just added to his total. He's got ten sacks now. Add another one to that one. They've got 31 sacks now in the NBA suit. 30. They came in with 29. Oh, that was the 30th, yes. Third down and long, third and nine. Wide open on the slant, quick slant across the middle is Metcalf, and Metcalf is in to Aggie territory down at the 47. So Metcalf, Terrence Metcalf, his 28th reception of the season. What's so ironic about that, Jay, was he came in averaging 23 yards per catch. As, as you see him there, when you got a big target like Metcalf, you just want to find a way to get him the football. You can't get him the football. As he's going there, he's going to run a skinny post route, and the quarterback does a good job of getting the ball to him on the skinny post route there. You see the route here is just a look-in post. He makes himself big. After the catch and the reception, he's running upfield. He's not going down easy. That's what I like. Campbell on the keeper. Down to the 40, a pickup of two yards on the play. 42 yards on that catch and run by Metcalf, so that kept his average. <laughs> One of the things we asked, we said, you know, we asked Coach Pugh, you know, you got a guy that's averaging almost 26 yards a catch, why don't you find more ways to get him the football? And I think he said, well, I got the answer to your question right there, Mr. Smarty Pants. <laughs> If you were quarterbacking my team, I probably would. <laughs> it is second down and eight. Aggie showing blitz and a quick fade pattern in the corner. And it's incomplete on the far sideline. And again, Metcalf, the intended receiver. Good job by the defensive back there of using the sideline. You've got a big body. Jason Horton. Jason Actually, that was Willis Ham, who was the intended receiver, 89 instead of 88. 89. His dad used to be the athletic director at uh, South Carolina State at one time. Yeah, and you see there Horton at the last second managed to locate the football and swat it away with his hands there. This is an Aggie defense. They create a lot of turnovers. They're secondary. They've got two guys in the secondary with five interceptions. So be careful where you throw the ball if you're South Carolina State. One of the things Horton said to us yesterday was he likes to cover the other team's best receiver, like Metcalf, people like that. Here's a little screen pass. Here's Maxwell. Maxwell is going to score. No, he's out at the three-yard line. Kambui Maxwell picking him up and laying him down. That was 36 beautiful. yards on the run by Maxwell. That was beautiful there. Perfectly designed screen. You've got an aggressive defensive line. As you watch the running back here, he's going to come in here, make himself small, then look at the entourage he has of the blockers out there in front of him. Lead blocks going as he has a nice little lane to run down. He does a good job of following his blockers. He sold his blocking protection. If you watch the play from the beginning, you thought he was blocking, he made himself small, then all of a sudden he reappeared again with a sprint down to the three-yard line for the South Carolina State Bulldogs. And in the backfield, a full house backfield. Going off the left side and getting into the end zone for the Bulldogs was Sherrard Pritchard, a sophomore running back. So Pritchard takes it in and the Bulldogs draw first blood does a good job. They came out with a full house backfield. They said, we're going to do power on power, mano e mano. And in that case, Pritchard did a good job of running low to the ground, keeping his pad level low and exploding into the end zone. On for the point after touchdown is Guy DiPaolo, sophomore out of West Palm Beach, Florida. And he is 19 of 28 in PATs this year. The kick is blocked. So the extra point fails. But we have a six to nothing lead. And it's South Carolina State on the board first here at the Beach State Classic from Atlanta. South Carolina State's a little rejoicing here. And here's the touchdown, the fourth rushing touchdown for this young man this year. 
what you do, you see everybody do a good job of getting blocking on blocking, leaving it up to this guy who started off over here, having to slide all the way down the defensive line in order to make the tackle. In this case, he got there just a little bit too late. Gets there, he gets down there, he slides from one side of football to the other, but he gets there a little bit too late. But this is what it all comes down to, special teams. We said the Aggies had to dominate. You have to let them know, 52. I love telling DePaulo, I'm going to be in your face all day, baby. Line drive kick picked up at the eight yard line on the return for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T is Brad Hinton, the sophomore out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And Hinton brings it up and gives them good field position at about the 37, 38 yard line. You know, what's so interesting was that touchdown by Gerard Pritchard. He's only carried the ball going into that particular carry, Jay. That was only his 13th touch this year. And out of 13 touches, he's put the ball in the end zone four times. Yeah, so he's got But he's like, only averaging 1.3 yards a carry. But that's all he needs. He's the big bruiser. Just, you know, just get it, give it to him down him, low. Give it to him fourth and one. <laughs> First and goal from the one. Right. <laughs> Don't go out to the two or three yard line because, you you know, the odds go down a little bit. But give it to them on the one, they'll get you a touchdown. From their own 38-yard line, third possession for the Aggies, trailing six to nothing. And the pitch back to Hudgens. Not much there for Mr. Hudgens as he was hit immediately defensively by Lester Davis. Number 41 came up to make the stop. It, Lester Davis, I mean, that's what you want to do. If you're going to chase down a running back when you've got a smaller running back, use that body. You can tell there he's got a lot of mass on him right there. This is the big fella here. He's got all that mass on him. Put it on somebody. That's what you got it there for. When you hit the running back, lay on him a little bit, lean on him a little bit. Six foot, 225 pounds from Mormon Beach right down the street from Bethune-Cookman. So he made it out of there somehow to Orangeburg. Here's Douglas throwing. He has a gun for an arm, doesn't he? he does. And he's able to throw. What is the amazing part of it is that pass goes incomplete. The amazing part of watching him practice yesterday was him being able to roll left. He's a right-hander and throw with the same accuracy and velocity as if he was running to his strength. Yeah, and that's kind of what you do when you're going to your left. If you know how to utilize it, you can get a little bit of extra torque on the ball. When your shoulders twist, they give you torque like almost in a golf swing. That extra torque creates more power, allows you to throw the ball a lot greater distances than you normally would be able to do. So on a third down passing situation, Hudgens, the lone setback, they're working out of the shotgun. Steps up, little flip pass to Kenny Perry, and Perry is out of bounds and has the first down across midfield at the 43-yard line of South Carolina State. So for Kenny Perry, his 10th reception of the year, he came in with nine and the average of 11.6. His longest reception was 44 yards. Douglas did a good job of showing poise and presence there. He got flushed out of the pocket. He continued to look downfield. Once he made one defender miss, he was looking for a receiver to throw the ball to rather than looking for a running lane. That one was good for 12 yards and a first down. Empty backfield this time for the Aggies. Hinton in motion to pitch to Huggins. And he picks up a couple of hard yards. Huggins came in averaging 4.5 yards per carry. He was a two-time MEAC Rookie of the Week. It happened against Howard University when he had uh, a big game against your former team. And uh, he also had a big game against Delaware State, both over 100 yards. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, we talk about the NEAC being such a good running conference. We've got running backs like Hudgens, Colbert. We've got uh, Stallings. These guys, they run the football. you got that type of talent. You have to become a running conference. you got to feed your future players. Hinton in motion. Douglas rolling right. Throws, and it's complete to Hinton. And Hinton's out of bounds, but a first down is gained down to the 27-yard line of South Carolina State. That's good for 13 yards. So take a look at Douglas, what he's going to do. After he makes the first guy miss, he just hits the guy on the out route. He hits it. We talked about him throwing the ball well on the run. Just a quick flick of the wrist to get it out there. He's got a natural throwing motion on the run. As well as he just got a pretty release in general. He throws a very pretty ball. Matter of fact, the first pass he threw yesterday, Charlie, kind of had your eyes wide open. Like, did you see that? <laughs> 28 touchdowns in the junior college career. Over 3,000 yards. And he said he didn't play a whole game. <laughs> You know, that's pretty impressive. Here's Hudgens running for about nine down inside the 20. 
Legends out of Williamston, North Carolina. And what's so amazing about this Aggie team is all of these freshmen and how well they're performing. Look at this right here, Charlie. This is what you got to love right here. This is man on man. Yeah, look at the hit right there. Hutchins kind of got the best of game to gather there in that situation there. He's running back, making an opportunity to deliver the blow. He took an, an advantage of that opportunity there. Look at that hit. On the option to pitch to Hudgens, he has the first down, but we have a penalty flag that's down on the field. But we talked about the youth of this team and what Bill Hayes was able to do. You know, he said, you know, that a lot of people picked up to finish second this year. He didn't think they were a second place team. Uh, he just wanted to get through the season. He came in with 64 new players and a whole bunch of new coaches. So he knew this was going to be a, a rebuilding year. As he, as he liked to say, you had to, you know, sometimes you, you put new carpet in the house. He said, this was the year we had to put a whole new furnace in. <laughs> a new, new furnace and a new roof and everything else. All the big major things you have to right. place in your house once in your career. Shot five on the offense. Ten yard penalty. Repeat the dial. And that's something I wanted to explain, chop block. We've been seeing that penalty come up more and more. The rule says on the chop block, if you're on the line of scrimmage and you're engaged with somebody, you can't come in and have another one of your teammates hit another guy below the waist. He can hit him high, but if you're engaged already with somebody and somebody hits you below the waist, they're going to call a chop block penalty. And they or more if more it's that. inside the 10-yard mark, yep. downfield, you can't have a chop block below the waist. Here's Hinton on the reception. Hinton trying to make people miss, and Hinton gets back to the 22-yard line. And it'll bring up a third down and about eight yards to go. Make it seven for the Aggies. And I like the play call there. You realize it's third, it's second and long. You've got two downs to try and get the first down. Grab a couple yards right now, get five or six yards on the carry, or a short pass, and then go for it again in third down where you have an opportunity to make the first down. For years, the Aggies were a wing T type team. Yes, they were. And now they've gone and switched to what we call the multiple eye, more man to man blocking versus the old pull and trap type plays that they used to run. Here's Douglas. He's, a flag is down. Now let's see what this is all about. Good defense on the part of South Carolina State not to allow Jason Douglas to turn the corner. And Ken Jones was the man standing there waiting for it. Holding is going to be called against the Aggies. Do you decline this one? Or do you move them back and let them give a, make it third and uh, about 15? Yeah, I'd actually I'd actually take the penalty. Anytime you can move them back a little bit further, make it a, a longer kick for you. Right now, in this type of game, you don't want to have them, have them get any points at all, considering you missed the PAT as well. So they're going to take the penalty and move them back. So to bring up a third and about 14, the ball resting at the 31-yard line of South Carolina State. And one of the things that uh, we okay. saw a decline in their running ability this year was last year the Aggies averaged over 200 yards a game rushing this year only 128. And that's just been the key of the fact that, hey, you got this spread offense and you got to make some changes. And they got young guys up there, so they'll get those numbers up there in the future. Screen to Hudgens in case his balance still will not get enough for the first down. And it'll bring up a fourth down situation as the ball will be spotted at about the 23-yard line of South Carolina State. So they tried to screen, but good defense on the part of the Bulldogs of South Carolina State who have done a fantastic job. There's a team that's come in with 27 sacks this year. They're fourth in the conference behind uh, Bethune, Cookman, A&T, and Hampton in terms of sacks. So here's the field goal kicking unit on for North Carolina A&T, and that'll be Yannick Mathis, Matthews, who hasn't missed a field goal this year. He's 2 of 2. His longest was a 30-yarder against Delaware State. This will be a 40-yard attempt. High snap, and we get whistles. Yeah, it looked like South Carolina State was trying to anticipate the snap count. They might have impeded that neutral zone a little bit too soon. So it may just make it a little easier for Yannick Mathis. Pat Simcox had started the season as the field goal kicker. He was 5 of 12. And since Yannick Mathis, Matthews has been on as the field goal kicker, he's 7 of 8 in PATs and 2 of 2 in field goals. 
He's also the punter, fifth in the conference in that department. As you look at Bill Hayes, the winningest coach in North Carolina A&T history. He got his 100th win in the MEAC. And it's offsides against against South Carolina State. We have a coach that on the defense. Five-yard penalty, repeat the down. I shouldn't say he got his 100th win in the MEAC. He had picked up his 100th win against the MEAC team, and that was against Bethune-Cookman uh, last year. He was win seemed like a long time ago. Yeah. Then. <laughs> and he was he's five wins away from hitting the 200 mark. Very few coaches in that fraternity. Billy Joe and Willard Bailey among active black coaches from black college programs. This one, will it make it? It is good. And it's from 35 yards out. And we'll take one. We'll be back. We have three points on the board for the Aggies. Six to three is our score. The Aggie band now they have something to celebrate. Their team on the board by way of a field goal from Yannick Mathis. Matthews, I want to keep calling him Mathis for whatever reason. Matthews, this, he's perfect in field goals this year, three of three. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I'm impressed by, the fact that they were even going to attempt a 40-yard field goal. Charlie, we know not too long ago you didn't see too many field goal attempts from 40 yards. The fact that they tried it and then he converted on the 35-yarder makes us know that the kicking game in black college football has come a long way. Yannick Matthews to kick it off for the Aggies. And this is a deep kick. It drives Jamie Scott all the way to the end zone. He will not get a chance to run it out. And he'll bring it out to the 20-yard line. And South Carolina State leading by a score of 6-3. to three. We'll get the ball when we come back. First and 10 at their own 20. Atlanta Sports and Entertainment Marketing. Preparing athletes for the business side of professional sports. 3.34, the time remaining here in the first quarter of play. 6 to 3 is our score. I'm Charlie Neal along with Jay Walker and Nicole Watson. We're in the Georgia Dome for the second annual Peach State Classic. The Aggies doing battle against the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. First and 10 for South Carolina State. They trail or lead in this ballgame, rather, 6 to 3. First down and 10 at their own 20. McCampbell working out of the shotgun. The play, the play uh, given off to Maxwell off the left side. Kambui Maxwell, who was averaging five yards a carry coming in to this particular ball game. And a student athlete of the week from the Aggies of North Carolina A&T is defensive back Montrell Pittman, a senior from Brattleboro, North Carolina, three-time academic All-American. 3.39 grade point average in mechanical engineering. In fact, last year won the Travis Kelly Leadership Award, named for an A&T athlete who died while playing football for North Carolina A&T back in the 80s. Travis Kelly was a kicker at A&T. Second down. And it's intercepted. The second interception that McCampbell has thrown today. And coming up with it for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Let's see. 23. There's Eddie Ravnell. McCampbell here is just going to force his ball into coverage. As you take a look, you'll see at least three North Carolina A&T defenders around the football. Ravino did a good job of shielding off the opposing wide receiver and making the catch. More importantly, that's a hard ball to catch because it's such a close throw. He held on to it. With the, he held on to the hard throw. Ironically enough, he'd only thrown six interceptions in the previous that's why 11 throw those, games. Throw those stats out the windows <laughs> on now Saturday. He has, three, he has two already this afternoon. Eddie Ravenel with the interception for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. And that is his fifth interception of the year. So great field position for South Carolina State. After the interception, they get the ball at the 23-yard line. Well, and that's one of the things we talk about the youth that this A&T team has. The starting center for North Carolina A&T is a true freshman. He's 17 years of age. Mm -hmm. So think about it. Although he can be as big and strong as you want him to be, he still has that young strength compared to that mature strength. And then the mental errors, the quarterback center exchange, things like that are what really penalize young teams. Excellent pass blocker, though. And here's Hudgens. And he's not going anywhere as Traveris Chandler made sure of that. 
on the defensive side of the ball for the South Carolina State Bulldogs. Let's go down in the cold. Well, Charlie, many were concerned about the transition of the legendary Coach Jeffries um, handing the baton off to Coach Buddy Pugh to, to hold up um, South Carolina State, but Coach Jeffries says he talks to Coach Pugh almost daily. He says everyone needs to respect Coach Pugh. He's a great offensive mind, and he's a hard worker. Also, he's a loyal bulldog. Now, Coach Pugh said it's hard to play such, replace such a radiant personality as Coach Jeffries, but he knows a little something about stepping in the shoes and following other radiant personalities. He was an assistant for Lou Holtz at USC from 1997 to 2001. Charlie and Jay, back to you. And he's a product of South Carolina State, coached at OW. Orangeburg Wilkinson, who's had so many defensive backs that came into the league from, and when I say the league, we're talking about the NFL, that came out of OW, Orangeburg Wilkinson, believe it or not. Yeah, they call the school the factory now. They want a DB, <laughs> go to the factory. They got a couple kids starting at Georgia, Clemson, Donnie Abraham, uh, Maurice Kelly. Uh, just the list goes on and on in terms of that Dwayne Harper came from there. So they've got a lot of DBs in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Yannick Matthews sorry, for the second straight field goal, a 35-yarder. He just hit one earlier, and he puts this one through, and we're all tied at six apiece. So back-to-back 35-yard -back field goals by Matthews. They convert on the turnover this time, and uh, they tie it up at six apiece. Don't forget, sports fans, next Saturday, NBC Network will showcase the best grueling gridiron action in black college football. We want you to sit back, order a large pizza. Jay will have two, and with pepperoni and everything on it, and a pull up a comfortable chair. That way you'll see 12 hours of football right here. It's called Classic Clashes. It starts at 11 a.m., and it'll go all the way till 11 p.m. at Saturday, November 30th. Right after Thanksgiving, you can, you know, fill up on some turkey, make a turkey pizza, right? Yeah, that's true. Charles, so funny. You really act like you're not right there eating with me. Huh? <laughs> Let's go take a look at the first quarter recap. As you see, starting off the game, Curtis DeLoach opened up, made a great interception on the opening series. And then Ivan Butler, we talked about in the intro, with the sack there, McCampbell, showing you the pressure we played. Then Terrence Metcalf split the two defenders down the seam. Great yards running after the catch. And then they got the ball in the picture for the touchdown, lowering the pad level. And then the hit of the game so far, going from Hudgens on Gathers. And then South Carolina State throwing another interception two thus far in the football game, leading to six points for the Aggies. So Matthews, four for four field goals this year. He's hit two 35-yarders in this particular contest from the 19-yard line. North Carolina, got some room. South Carolina State, that's Jermaine Brown. Jermaine Brown across midfield, and Jermaine Brown down to the 44-yard line of North Carolina A&T. Jermaine Brown out of Gainesville, Florida, a junior. His longest return this year was 57. That one was 37 yards. It did a good job. The Bulldog special teams unit set up a wedge on the right side of the field, even though the ball was kicked far to the left. Let's take a look at the replay here. I see all these defenders from South Carolina State come this way. Ball's kicked over here. He does a good job of finding the wedge. Look at the, look at the entourage he's got up there. A great job by the return man of finding the wedge. And once you get to that wedge, you just have to make one or two miss. A little more foot speed, he might have gotten to the end zone, but nonetheless, a great return. He averaged 23 yards per kickoff return. That one's good for 32. And again, they keep the ball on the ground. This time, it's Jamie Scott out of Mullen, South Carolina. A transfer from South Carolina. One of six that Buddy Pugh was able to bring over with him, along with a young man by the name of Derek Watson, who had gotten in some trouble at South Carolina, uh, University of South Carolina. Came over with Buddy Pugh to South Carolina State. Had a little problem after the third game of the year. Back on the team, not here today because of an injury. That's the only reason he's not playing. Yeah, and he's a fantastic football player. We got an opportunity to see him earlier. He's just one of those guys that does a lot of things for you. He doesn't stand out and serve. He's the fastest guy or the quickest guy. He's just a football player. He can run, he can catch, he can block, he can make you miss. And that's the end of one here in Atlanta. It's all tied at six apiece. A pair of field goals by the Aggies and a three-yard run by a &T. Today's game is brought to you in part by Office Depot. What you need, what you need to know. Skyline of Atlanta, Georgia. We're in the dome in Atlanta, the Aggie. Mascot is here, and we are all tied at six apiece. As we start the second quarter, I'm Charlie Neal along with Jay Walker and Nicole Watson. First down and make that second down. Here's a total yard. South Carolina State with the edge. 
trying to keep the ball on the ground this time for South Carolina State. Reese McCampbell, quarterback, keeping it. Here's Mr. Goolsby, our student athlete from South Carolina State. He is a junior from Warner Robins, Georgia, and has a 3.1 grade point average in computer science. Congratulations to both of our student athletes today. Montrell Pittman of North Carolina A&T, Leonard Goolsby of South Carolina State, and not much running room for Jamie Scott. He is brought down immediately. And on the stop is Eddie Ravenel, who already has an interception to his credit this afternoon. They're flying around the football. That's what you have to do with this spread offense, or as Coach Hayes like to call it, this dart spread offense. You got to attack. You have to make sure you know where the football is, and then once you locate the football, run to the football full speed ahead. Don't let them get those extra yards just because you weren't paying attention. So South Carolina State's drive goes three and out. I shouldn't say three and out because they didn't really... Well, that, it really did go three and out. They had good field position after the long punt, re or punt return or kickoff return. And here is a punt in situation for Brandenburg. And they'll just let it die. The ball will bounce right at the 15-yard line, and that's where it will die with 13.34 remaining here. And we're in the second quarter after only a 24-yard punt by Mr. Brandenburg, who was averaging 38 yards per punt. We're all tied at six apiece in Atlanta. Charlie Neal along with Jay Walker and Nicole Watson as you look at the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. And you look at Jason Douglas bringing his team on the field. One All tied at six apiece. Yeah, one of the interesting things about Jason Douglas, we mentioned this is his first start of the year. He feels like, hey, I've been a starter my whole career. In junior college, I always started, so I'm not a new starter to the collegiate level, and he's playing with some poise today. I believe him. Hudgens going into the gut of the defense. And the defense of South Carolina State has been very stingy in terms of giving up running yards. Jack Johnson, linebacker, one of the men to, to meet the running back, Hudgens, as he hit the hole. You know, we talked about Hudgens, and I talked to him a good bit yesterday, and I was saying about reading and who he liked as a, a running back, who he patterned his game after. He said, Corey Dillon was one. The other person he named was Gail Sears, and you jumped <laughs> on him. You said, you don't know anything about Gail Sears. You're not young enough, old enough to know anything about Gail Sears. He said, but I watch TV. I watch film. I watch classic games. I know, I've seen enough to know I like Gail Sears. I said, well, tell me about when you look at a, a guy like Gail Sears or Corey, Corey Dillon, what you like about them and reading holes and cutbacks and things like that. He said, one of the things that made me laugh, he said, sometimes there's false daylight out there. You think there's a, <laughs> there's a hole and there's actually no hole there. False he said. <laughs> yeah. On the offense, five-yard penalty, repeat second down. Bill Hayes not happy with that call. And mistakes like that is what really has hurt them throughout the year. Here's a team that has been penalized an average of 87, 88 yards a game coming into this uh, particular ball game throughout the season. Yeah, you know, that's it, what you get. They're, they're going to learn. These are just mental errors that you get. False starts, delay a game. Those are mental errors. As you mature, you make less and less of those type of mistakes. Second and 12. Douglas bobbled the ball a little bit, now throws it out in the flat and has it complete on the far sideline to Michelle Hollingsworth. They call him the show. <laughs> the show. Mr. Hollingsworth, he was the rookie of the year for the team last season. This is the 17th reception of the year for the show. <laughs> for the show. And Kareem Sanders, you know what they call him? The right tackle? Sky right Hook, no, Abdul-Jabbar. No, they call him Big Baby. <laughs> <laughs> the Big Baby. Because he's, he's young and he weighs about 300 pounds. Look at that pass. Dumped off. Great pass and Hudgens comes up with the first down up to the 39 yard line. I just like the way Douglas plays and that one's good for 17. Yeah, he did a fantastic job there. He's, he's nimble on his feet. He's got mobility. I mean, when you have the size he has, he's only 5'11", about a buck 60 at that. When you have that, that type that, of <laughs> you know, when you have to be, have creative ways to get away from those defensive linemen, buying time, allowing your receivers to get open down the field, more importantly scramble, but continue to look downfield making your reads. And this 
pass as Jamal Jones gets the reception. He had 468 yards and a pair of touchdowns a year ago on 32 receptions. And they're going without the huddle. There's the stats on Jason Douglas today, 9 of 12 for 94 yards. Under pressure. Throws incomplete. Boy, you're talking about standing in there and defying the odds. Eugene Williams had him all wrapped up, and Eugene is still fussing at his own inability to bring down the light quarterback. Yeah, I mean, we said he weighed a buck 60, but he must have some strength in those legs. That must be where the only muscle is. As you see here, Eugene Williams has him wrapped up. He's got a sack. He's looking downfield. Look at this. He recoils and says, well, he's not going to take me down. And he still almost completed <laughs> almost the pass. Completed I thought he was going to. Third down and about three. And we're going to get a flag. So there was a timeout call by the Aggies. They're going to spend one here with 11.30 to go. We'll take a timeout here. It is all tied at six apiece. Third and three facing the Aggies when we return. To learn more about the MIAC, visit our website. MiacSports.com and support your favorite team. You just saw Dennis Thomas, the commissioner of the Mid East Athletic Conference. When I met him, he was the defensive coordinator of Alcorn State. They call that the tunnel defense. You go in the tunnel, you don't come out. Well, that reminds me of the statement Hutchins made about that false daylight. You think there's a hole there and there's nothing. You go up in there and there's no a point of no return. Right? Point of no return or a headache, either or. Which one do you want? It is third down and three for. The Aggies from the shotgun and the pitch back to Hudgens. Hudgens is not going to get it. He is stopped short. And coming up is Tavares Chandler, who made sure that the running back Hudgens did not advance to the first down mark. In fact, they lost a couple of yards, and that'll bring up a fourth down punting situation, fourth and five. They lost two on the play, and we have a player injured for South Carolina State downfield. Looks like one of the secondary players who's ailing down there at about the 36-yard line. Looks like Ellaby there. DeWitt, Ellaby, Ellaby. Let's go down to Nicole on the sideline. Nicole? All right, Charlie, with me now is the mayor of our proud city of Atlanta, Shirley Franklin. And Shirley, I know that you're very supportive of this game being here in Atlanta because Atlanta has a history of having a huge alumni base and supporting black college sports. Absolutely. We have African-American colleges here uh, at the Atlanta University Center. We're so glad to have the Aggies and the Bulldogs in Atlanta for this second annual Peach State Conference. Okay. A lot of people don't know, also, Mayor Franklin is a bison. She went to the same school that our and color analyst Jay Walker went to. How important is it for HBCUs to kind of stick together? Oh, we, ne we definitely need to stick together. We've got to make a pitch for more federal funding and more private funding. And just to demonstrate that uh, these colleges and universities really have made a big difference in American history by preparing African Americans for leadership. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Mayor Franklin. I know you're going to make a presentation at halftime. We we'll look forward to seeing that. Thank you okay. very much. Thank, thank you. you. Charlie and Jay, back to you. All right, thank you very much. And a lot of action and activities going on here in Atlanta. I've seen the mayor on the news quite a bit lately, especially with the corrections officers. They have <laughs> having their problems uh, with uh, the layoffs that are threatened. But let's look at our latest major black college sports poll. And you see Grambling stays number one, along with Bethune-Cookman. Tuskegee, number three, followed by Alabama A&M, moved up, and then Hampton. We'll get the rest of it for you in a moment. McCampbell throwing long. Intercepted, a third interception of the day for McCampbell, and coming up with the INT for the Aggies of North Carolina INT is James McCoy. McCoy made a fantastic catch there, recognizing where the ball was. To, to take a look here, they're going to roll out the quarterback, get him outside the pocket. McCoy's got his back turned, but he's peeking inside the whole time in anticipation of the ball coming behind him. He was able to stop before the wide receiver, Metcalf, could. Turk, hit on the brakes, get the interception, get the ball back to the Aggies. That's three interceptions on the day, Charlie. I told you, throw those stats out the window on Saturday. They just don't matter. There's Mr. McCoy celebrating on the sideline. James McCoy, his third interception of the year. He moved from running back last season. First and ten Aggies at their own 42-yard line. 
43. Hudgens stumbling out of bounds after he crosses the 45. Let's look at the second half of the poll for this week. Fayetteville State, Florida A&M back in. Morgan to eighth. Alcorn ninth. Jackson State tenth. Yeah, Howard you, dropped out this week. You had to say that, didn't you? <laughs> had to say that. First time in a long time, a lot of parity going on in black college football. A lot of teams there with multiple losses. Normally you see two okay. losses there, but see teams there with three or four losses on the year. So it tells you it's getting very competitive on all levels of black college football. Fort Valley and uh, South Carolina State also dropped out of the top ten poll. And speaking of Jackson State, we'll see them a little later on tonight. Dwayne, Mark, and Joyce are down in Jackson for that matchup in terms of football the uh, final game for Alcorn and Jackson State and of course immediately following this game we'll take you to Raleigh North Carolina where Sam Smith and Bernie Bickerstaff along with Kim Davis are there to bring you the Shaw Cleflin basketball contest here on NBC third down fade pattern down the right side in and out of the hands of Jamal Jones. Good defense there downfield for South Carolina State by Kenley. I mean, one of the things you like about this here is the chop block there, obviously, by Hutchinson was awesome. But then take a look. If this wide receiver, Jones doesn't go up and try and catch this ball at its highest point, and Kenley was waiting to pick it off. Yeah. So that's what you have to learn out there as you go out there and you try and catch the ball at its highest point. Don't wait for it to come to you. Don't make the easy catch. Make the tough catch. And Kenley did a good job of covering a lot of ground to make the hit. So it's been a defensive battle, a lot of punts so far in this game. This one close to being blocked. Fair catch call for made at the 22-yard line, and it was a 30-yard punt for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. And we're still tied at six apiece, under 10 minutes to go in the first half. First down to 10, Bill Hayes' team. Six points on the board with 9.56 to go. South Carolina State with the ball, and Reese McCampbell has thrown three interceptions. And, you know, coming into the game, Jay, he was ranked 19th in the nation in 1AA in passing efficiency with a rating of 141.9. And the formula has to do with attempts, completions, touchdowns as compared to interceptions as they keep the ball on the ground trying to go right this particular time with Chris Burgess on the end of the round. And let's look at the three interceptions that uh, this young man, Reese McCampbell has thrown today. Yeah, on the opening series, trying to excite the crowd early, throwing the deep ball, great coverage by Curtis Deloach there. This one, he just forced it in the coverage there, three Aggie defenders trying to get the short pass, and this one here, rolling out of the pocket, under throws a ball here. If he gets that ball out there a little further, he has a chance. On the other thrown ball, the defender did a good job of making the play there for three interceptions on the year. Let's see if Coach Pugh and his staff get a little gun, third interception on the game, excuse me. Let's see if Coach Pugh and his staff get a little gun shy and start running the ball a little bit more, trying to settle the quarterback down. If there's any consolation to it, they've only given up three points. And there's a good completion down the middle of the field. And on the receiving end for the Bulldogs of South Carolina State was Maurice Manurin. <laughs> I wanted to hear you pronounce that name. <laughs> He's out of South Ozone Park, New York. 39 yards on the reception. Good job. Look at the quarterback. Look the safety off to the right just to freeze him there, then throw a rope down the seam into Morris Mayoni <laughs> down the seam there. Good job of holding on to it after the hit. Well, you see, they didn't give up and didn't, didn't stick to the running game. They decided, hey, the kid's been my quarterback all year long. He's been completing them, so why don't we stay with him? He sets up the throw, but he's not going to get away from the Aggie rush this time as William Paul rated the number four Juco lineman a year ago. That's his second sack of the year. Yeah, good job of swarming to the football there. They've got some D tackles that get at you on that North Carolina A&T side. They're kind of bring back that, that blue death concept that they had for so many years. That's what they, they did. They, yeah. they, they well, the cover of their press guide this year says return of the blue death defense. Yeah. A lot of people say I was responsible for the fall of the blue death <laughs> defense, but they brought it back. But the phenomenal job. They've got some talent. Everybody knows in the whole conference, they say, hey, the Aggies are down right now. We better get them while they're down because yeah. they're yeah. definitely coming back. McCampbell wants to go to the air under pressure. Fumbles the ball. But we're going to get a face mask. Unfortunately for the Aggies, we're going to get a face mask penalty against them defensively. Even though there was a fumble, 
so they will not get the ball back. You know, this is something there. This is, as a quarterback, when you have a screen play call and they had a screen set up, your, your coach, don't get sacked no matter what. Get rid of the football, do whatever you can, but you can't risk getting sacked, trying to hold on to it for that last moment, getting off the screen pass. You should have just thrown this away. He's such a good athlete that he thought he could make somebody miss and run out the pocket a little bit. If the screen play's not set up, get rid of the ball. They'd much rather have third and 15 than third and 35. Or the fumble in that case, they got lucky. They got away with it. There. I think if there's any, been any knock on First foul. Wrong. Face by the hey, we're over here. <laughs> Our referee, Daniel Evans, got turned around, but let's watch it. Yeah, this is a screen pass. He's waiting for the running back out this way. The rush just comes and swarm him. They get on him so fast. But you see him, he's such a good athlete. He's going to try and make this guy miss instead of get rid of the ball. He gets a hold of the face mask there, and that's a that should be a 15-yard face mask as it was. That's a personal foul. Rule on that one is if your hand accidentally gets stuck in there and you let go, they'll give you a five-yarder. But if you hold on to it and bring them down using the helmet, it's a 15-yard penalty. People get hurt that way. John Jones was the man who was uh, guilty of the infraction, first and ten. And they keep it on the ground this time. South Carolina State, Cam Bowie, Maxwell, nowhere to go that time. And Sean Jones, who picked up the penalty on the previous play, kind of atoned a little bit for that miscue on the face mask penalty and coming up with the tackle. Yeah, you know, in every game, I was talking to Robbie Wells, the defensive coordinator of South Carolina State. He said, if you look at back at every game, there are going to be about four or five plays that are difference makers. And they're things that don't show up in the stat sheet. That face mask could be the one, because if there wasn't a face mask, A&T would have got a fumble, been on their way to scoring a touchdown with great field position. Now, at the end of the day, if they score, if South Carolina State scores, that means they capitalize on the turnover. Jamie Scott in the backfield. McCampbell throwing toward the end zone. Intercepted the fourth one today. Can you believe it? And this one is Montreal Pittman. And for Pittman, he brings it back. Out across the 15 to about the 20. Yeah, one of the things you can't do is have a ball hanging in the air for that long. You know, I, I wasn't even necessarily looking at the receiver he was throwing to. I was just amazed that I saw a ball hanging in the air this long. He's rolling out to his left. He doesn't get that torque. He kind of lost his ball up there with more trajectory than he needs. He overthrows the receiver. Pittman does a good job of getting over there to the football. I talked to the defensive coordinator earlier. He said that Pittman is just a ball hawk. Yoshida said, oh, my goodness, Pittman is going to be all over the field today. And he proved his coach right here just now. Preseason second team all conference, one of the best in the conference, came in the game with five interceptions. The Aggies came into the game with a plus 40 takeaways. They have 44 takeaways so far this season. And here is Douglas. He's under pressure. He will not escape. They're going to call out a fumble. If it's recovered, it's a touchdown for South Carolina State. We haven't heard, seen any. Yes, the official finally puts his hands up. Touchdown there. That Pooler defense. Streak Pooler coming up with it. So one good turn deserves another, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny how that football bounces. You never know which way it's going to go. You go for you, the same things that make you laugh, it can also make you cry. In this case there, I thought there might have been a face mask there, but I didn't see any flags come up on the face mask. In that case there, South Carolina State got the ball in the end zone, and they swarmed to the ball. Key thing I like about it, you see that race to the end zone between oh. the offensive lineman and the defensive oh, yeah. lineman? <laughs> I didn't know whether the quarterback was down when the ball came out. That was the only thing I was concerned about, whether he actually was down, because, of course, we know the ground cannot cause a fumble. They're going to go for the two-point conversion. But Campbell, he has one lone setback beside him, and he's keeping it, looks to throw. Now he's trying to turn the corner. He will not get there. He will not get there. The Aggies deny by way of Shamar Milton, the freshman linebacker. Here's a timeout on the field. And it's 12 to 6, our score. Let's look at the play once again. The big hit by South Carolina State's Matthew Brigham. And now the recovery by Drake Pooler. Today's game is brought to you in part by the Verizon Reads Program. 
from the Georgia Dome in Atlanta, Charlie Neal, Jay Walker, Nicole Watson, the Peach State Classic, and the Aggies of North Carolina and T trailing by six points after South Carolina State recovered a fumble by Jason Douglas in the end zone. And as you see here, the quarterback Douglas holds on to the ball a little bit. Good double team by Brigman forcing the fumble, McLeod stripping it, and then you got the race to the end zone between the big fellow, the center, Jones, going against a major. They ended up getting there after all that hustle and the hustle and everything going on down the end zone. Touchdown for South Carolina State. And let's look at our office depot. NBC Player of the Week. This week's honor goes to Oregon State running back T.J. Stallings, who put on a show against South Carolina State last week. 5'9", senior from Randallstown, Maryland, rushed for 177 yards, scored three times, and carried the ball a school record 45 times. He also set the school single-season rushing record with 1,047 yards, which was last set by Ali Culpepper. The play of Stallings this season has helped Morgan to their first winning season since 79, and for his efforts, T.J. Stallings of Morgan is our NBC player of the week. We have a penalty flag down. Aggies with the ball at the 49. Let's see what this was about. Ball start on the offense. Five yard penalty. Repeat the down. Got a false start there. Just the young immaturity of this team right here. Plays like this. When you're a team that likes to do three yards in a cloud of dust, you can't afford to move back or five yards at a time. Because instead of first and 10, you're looking at first and 15. Makes it tough to get that if you're a running team. They have changed quarterbacks. Marshall Glenn is in. Six penalties for the Aggies. 49 yards, two for South Carolina State for 10. First down and 10. Here's Glenn. Freshman and he throws Jamal Jones has it and Jamal Jones is met right at the 45 yard line. He actually didn't gain any yards. He lost yards. He gained yards from the original point of the snap of the ball, but they're still going to be about 11, 12 yards shy of getting the first down. So it'll be second and 11. They've got the new quarterback in the game, Marshall Glidden there. 6'2", 190-pound guy out of Charlotte, 498 yards on the season. True freshman, he's not in there because Douglas played bad. They plan on using a rotating quarterback system, trying to see which quarterback has the better field today. This pass is, is complete to Hollingsworth, and he's across midfield, and it'll bring up a third and about five. I had an opportunity to ask Marshall Glenn, well, what do you think about Jason Douglas in a truly competitive environment as we see? Hollingsworth limping. Hollingsworth limping off the field there. Said, so, you know, we're, we're kind of like brothers right now. You know, I respect him. He respects me. I didn't expect to play, so I got an opportunity to play. So a mutual respect thing. But I told him, oh, come next year, there'll be some competition. Jamal Jones is out there. Off his fingertips. Incomplete covered, double covered downfield by Anthony Gathers and Justin Kenley. Kinley and Gathers, they, they're playing that cover two defense and they're trying to exploit the seams, the outside seams of the cover two. But what's happened is you got Kinley back there who's a converted cornerback playing safety. So he's a lot quicker than your normal safety would be in that situation there. That's why we've seen Kinley make plays like that time in, time out today. And again, we see Yannick Matthews on to punt for the Aggies. His fifth punt of the afternoon. gets off a good one you let that one go and it does go into the end zone Goldsby lets it go will bring it out to the 20 yard line first down and 10 for South Carolina State and to kick off the holiday NBC is serving up a week of special programming we want you to enjoy the smooth sounds of red hot and cool it comes your way this Monday Wednesday and Friday at a special time 8 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. Eastern. NBC, your family's urban network for smooth jazz. <laughs> I was like, what's the name of that show again? Say the name of that show for me. Red Hot and Blue. <laughs> Red Hot and Cool. The way you say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like you got ice waters in your veins, Charlie. You got those golden pipes that me and Mark Gray always say, man, we do anything. Making him Charlie sleep one night. They can go in there and take his, his, his throat and his vocal cords from him. That priceless voice sounds crystal clear. They tried to get me to do the James Bond movie. <laughs> and I said I had to be with you. <laughs> what are you going to call you? Call, call you Golden Throat? <laughs> 
Hallie was begging. <laughs> you said no to Hallie Berry. You a bad man. <laughs> uh, first and ten. South Carolina State. McCampbell still in. Running right. Turning the corner, keeping it, and getting the first down across the 30 to the 31-32 yard line. Give him 11 yards on the run. Reese McCampbell. When you've got that type of offense, it's just a quarterback making a read off a defensive end there. In that instance there, Marvin Blackstock, the DN for North Carolina a t had McCampbell in the backfield, but they say you get a quarterback that can square up the defensive lineman, the quarterback with athleticism should be able to make that defensive lineman miss. You saw it there. One of the things that South Carolina State has done, even in a passing situation, was protect their quarterback as we have Jamie Scott is loose in the secondary, and he's down inside the 40 to the 38 of the Aggies. They have protected their quarterback very well this year. Coming into the game, they've only been sacked eight times, and that's going to be very interesting to see because they mix their running and passing so well. Take a look here. I want you to watch this guy here once the play runs. He's got to watch this quarterback here. Watch how he freezes them. The ball's not even there, but that's his responsibility to take a look at where the quarterback is. You see him freezing there? He did the freeze, and then that's one less guy going after the running back. It opens up a scene somewhere. You've got an advantage running. Now, all of a sudden, instead of having six guys trying to block seven, you've got six on six, and a good running back should find a hole. Let's go down to the cold. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. With me now is Dr. Johnny Hodge. He is the band director here for North Carolina a and has been here for 24 years. And Dr. Hodge, you have to tell me, I know it's just as competitive with the bands as it is with the team. Is that it true? Is. It's definitely very, very competitive with HBCU bands. Tell us, you said there was a certain part and a pivotal point where you all know that you got the respect from other teams. Well, back in 1991, they had the Gold Bowl here in Atlanta, and our band won it, and we, uh, that's when we really became came known among the HBCU bands. What has changed over the years? You know, they play a lot of hip hop and hip -hop. Now, what has changed with the bands for you? Uh, it's the competition among the bands. Everybody wants to have the uh, name of being the best HBCU band. So your students work hard, your universities work hard to market the band. So we are an integral part of our university. Okay, well, we always enjoy it. Thank you so much for being with us, and congratulations on your 24 years today in team. Thank you so very much. My pleasure. Charlie and Jay next week. All right, Johnny Hodge saying he may retire after this year, but he said that many times before. Here's Jamie Scott turning the corner. Jamie Scott inside the 15 to the 14. So he's picking him up and laying him down. And James, that one was good for 23 yards. And James Jamie Scott just going inside, outside, inside, outside, throwing moves the whole time he's running. Good running back to have the ability to make a cut on the dime here. Run the daylight on the outside, which is real daylight. Then don't go out of bounds. Cut back inside. Then cut back outside. Little zigzag in there. Those extra yards get that much closer to the end zone. This drive started at their own 20. They're inside the 15 of the Aggies. Number two in the conference in red zone offense this year. When they've gotten down there, they've scored seven of the eight times. And here they're trying to get to the left side this time, but McCampbell will not be able to get away. This time, Varese Utley, the linebacker, came up to make the stop. Varese Utley made a fantastic play there. Normally, the linebacker, you're looking for somebody that can hit somebody all the time. In this case, he's going to come into your picture here late, and he's just going to do a full sprint and track down the quarterback from the backside, and McCampbell can run. But look at Utley. He's got a head of steam going, just pure speed. That's why you have to be able to run as a linebacker as well as hit. He's the leading tackler for the Aggie Blue Death defense, and he's a preseason second team all-conference. You see the stats on him right there. Burgess in motion. Oh! oh. And who came through again was that young man we talked about just a moment ago, Maurice Utley. I mean, they're on to something there. They moved him to the outside. They got more, him to more than something. They got him blitzing from the outside. When you've got fresh young legs like this, you can just stop the whole play. He's in the backfield before the quarterback has time to even look downfield. Utley's there taking away his ankles from him. You take away a quarterback or any position player's ankles, they're not going anywhere, Charlie. I think Utley said, I'm mad. I'm not taking this anymore. <laughs> That's what you want. You want your best player to step up and make big time plays kind of sounds like a player's player doesn't it Charlie third and 22 yes it does incomplete Burgess the intended receiver and in a bring up a fourth down situation for the Bulldogs of South Carolina State the ball right at about the 26 yard line 
It'll be a 43 yard field goal attempt if they decide uh -uh. to guide DePaulo. <laughs> so let's see what they do. They're going to go for it on fourth down. This is one of the few times that they have failed in the red zone as you look at Bill Hayes. They're going to go for it on fourth down, and this year on fourth down conversions, 39% for the Bulldogs, 11 of 28. McCampbell standing in there, looking across the middle, incomplete. Goolsby, the intended receiver. There were Aggies all around. Yeah, in that case, there one. I'm not going to say one of the few times this game, but he ended up going to the wrong receiver there. You had two slot receivers running seam routes. Should have went to the guy on the left side rather than the receiver on his right. Aggies were expecting the guy on the right. Trick him up a little bit and throw the ball back left. Let's look at a couple of scores. Uh, oh, no, you did. Howard University. Why do you start with that? Well, that's a MEAC <laughs> game, and uh, Hampton. Lost to Morgan. So Morgan, wow, boy, really came on strong at the end of the year. Coach Hill Ely doing a great job up there in Baltimore. First down and 10. And that's what it's about there. We saw that Morgan Hampton score. That's when if you're an alumni of Morgan State, Hampton's been talking to you, talking down on you all these years. That's when you get out the checkbook and you make a check out to the Morgan State Football Department, the alumni. Let the kids know that you appreciate them. As with, uh, black colleges start to get more exposure, they're going to need these type of funds to help the program reach certain levels to be all they can be. On a snap. Keeping it on the ground again, the Aggies with Hudgens on the carry. And Marshall Glenn in at quarterback. So Howard finishes the season, what, six and five? Four and four in the conference. And they were right in the thick of the things, you know, at, you know, at one point. All the way to last week. They certainly were. October did a lot of people in. <laughs> and I'll talk about that in a moment as far as this conference is concerned. It's third down and four. From the gun, Glenn. Incomplete. Jamal Jones. And we get a flag? Is this an interference flag? I mean, the field judge threw it. He was down at the goal line. He threw that about 80 yards, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Richard Martinez. But we talk about the October situation. Here's our, they're going to call interference against South Carolina State. Uh, South Carolina State beat FAMU beginning of October. Then Howard beat FAMU in Tallahassee. Morgan beat A&T in Greensboro to spoil their homecoming. That was the following week, October 12th. Then October 19th, you had Florida and m beat A&T in Tallahassee. Morgan beat Howard in D.C. And then Bethune beat South Carolina State in Orangeburg. Then on the 26th of October. <laughs> Pass interference by the defense. Uh, greater than 15 yards. We'll penalize 15 yards from the previous spot. First down. South Carolina State beat Hampton in Orangeburg. Howard beat A&T in Greensboro. That was just the month of October. I mean, it was just turmoil. Then November, of course, FAMU beat Hampton. Delaware State beat South Carolina State. And then a couple weeks ago, it was Hampton beat Bethune. Howard beat South Carolina State. Norfolk beat North Morgan. And right now, it's who? Bethune, Cookman, and Florida and m They're playing today to see who wins the outright championship or if it's going to be a share. Hudgens going off the left side. And Hudgens close to a first down after a nine-yard gain. And he takes it down to the 44-yard line. And he does have a combination of Ward Dunn and Corey Dillon. It's kind of weird that, you know, you compare him to those type of guys. because well, He said Gail Sayers. He said Gail Sayers, but some of us say Ward Dunn. His teammate told him Ward Dunn, but then somebody else said Corey Dillon. He's got that inside-out ability. He doesn't just let one defender bring him down, but he's got enough quickness that he can make one defender miss, almost like a Ward Dunn, and the strength of Corey Dillon to run through a tackle. Minute 30 to go in the first half. Incomplete. This pass on the near sideline. Doug Brown was the intended receiver. And defending downfield was Tavares Chandler. He's been on a number of plays today. Getting back to that MEAC picture, I think a lot of teams are going to be upset. They didn't take advantage of a down year at Florida A&M. You know what they say kind of about a king. You don't want to make a king angry. If you're going to make a king angry, you better kill him. Because if not, the king's going to come back and kill you. And Florida A&M got an opportunity to win the MEAC title, a year when a lot of people didn't think they should be there. Coach Joe's done a tremendous job of coaching to get his team in a position to win another MEAC championship. On a reverse coming to the near side. 
And running with a reckless abandon down to the 30-yard line. And a first down is Jamal Jones. Good job. And that was good for 14 yards. Yeah, good job of setting up the misdirection. If you're going to have a reverse, you have to do misdirection one way. This way, they're going to start off this way with a lead blocker. You're going to see the reverse come around this way, that way. That's what makes reverses successful. The key of the misdirection, they're going to fake it like they're going to the left, come back right, get a lead blocker out there, give it to Jamal Jones, your playmaker, and allow him to sprint up the field, get you close to the end zone. Quick pass out. That pressure was being applied to the quarterback, Marshall Glenn, by Dreek Pooler. He was coming with everything. Dreek Pooler was bringing, and so was Eugene Williams, the big defensive end there. They were bringing the pressure, trying to get to the young quarterback. You got Marshall in there, a true freshman. They're trying to welcome him to the, you've already gone through the MEAC play. Now welcome to the Carolina version of MEAC football. You know, on second down and 10 from the 30. Under a minute to go here in the first half. We have a 12-6 ball game. South Carolina State out in front. And running the ball for the Aggies right now is Frank Patterson. So we get a flag for a timeout. And this one is called by the Aggies. North Carolina and team, their last. Their last timeout with 49 seconds to go. And a third down and five facing them. But more importantly, they want to get into the end zone before the half at least tie the score up and possibly take the lead. Yeah, and you want to call two plays here from the sideline. You got a play called in case you get the first down where you hurry up and you don't have to waste time calling another play. Second one is if we get the incompletion, let's hurry up and get the field goal unit on the field if we're going to attempt the field goal. Let's, good, good time out. Let's look at the current MEAC standings as they were coming into today's action. Bethune Cookman and they're playing Florida AM. Of course, if Bethune Cookman wins, they outright win the MEAC championship. If Florida AM wins, we know Hampton will not be a three way tie because they've already lost today. But if Florida AM wins, now it's a two way tie. Florida AM would get the automatic bid as the conference champ to the 1 AA playoffs, but I feel that Bethune Cookman really to also get an opportunity because they would go in with 10 wins. Yeah, and, and there's some schools behind them that have some losses, have more losses than they have. And their losses would have come to real quality programs. Losing to Hampton and Florida a in one year, there's nothing wrong with that. Jamal Jones catch, but right there to make sure he wasn't going anywhere was Gathers, who has a cousin by the name of Jumpy Gathers who played in the National Football League with the Redskins. And he came up strong that time. So it'll bring up a four Fourth down situation and with 26 seconds to go they cannot stop the clock but they are going to try a field goal with Yannick Matthews coming on he's two for two in field goals today this one will be a 42 yard attempt the kick is up it is Good! 42 <laughs> wow. yards! So Yannick Matthews has hit three field goals this afternoon. He is perfect for the season. Five of five. Good job there. Good leg. Hitting it from these. Hit the short ones. He's hit it from the right hash. He's hit it from the left hash. He does a good job of getting his body completely through here. Take a look at the timing there. Ball's down. Kicks up in the air. And he's there. And look at that. When you make a field goal that long, once it goes through, uh, yes, sir. I knew it was good all the way. Like, look, he's kicking the ball from the right hash there, so you got to pull it a little bit, which a lot of college kids have trouble doing, pulling the ball because the college hash marks are a lot wider than the right. NFL hash marks. So you have to have accuracy as well as distance and the ability to directionally kick. So he's hit three, two from 35 yards out. That one coming from 42, and it's a three-point ball game with four seconds left in the half, 12 to 9. The Aggies started that drive at their own 26 and capped it with the field goal. As I mentioned earlier, Pat Simcox, who had started the season, he had missed seven field goals. And, of course, all the field goals that Matthews has kicked today were his longest. His previous longest was 30 yards. Trying to prevent a long run back for the Aggies. 
And it was Jamie Scott bringing it back, and that's going to end the first half here from Atlanta, Georgia. The Dome and the Peach State Classic. As they go to the locker room, the Bulldogs enjoying a three-point advantage. They led 6-0 on Pritch's three-yard run. And now they lead it 12-9. Let's go down to Nicole. All right, Coach Pew. The Campbell has thrown four interceptions, and yet you, you all are on top. I know you're a little bit concerned about that. You think it's butterflies, or it's the, the defense pressure so much? Well, you know, I don't know exactly what's happening. You know, we had a couple misreads, a couple balls kind of came out of his hand a little crazy. You know, we just can't throw that many picks. You know, I almost feel like I see a ghost. You know, there's no way in the world. You know, you, you, you throw four interceptions, you're still ahead. But, you know, we've got to play a lot better second half offensively. Our, our defense is going to get worn out. What will you concentrate on in the second half? Well, we got to find something to get the ball out on the field more consistently. We, we really have been just so inconsistent offensively that, you know, we don't keep the football though. We want to control it more, and we want to get in the end zone. Okay, consistency and control. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. All right, Charlie and Jay. All right, thank you, Nicole. Of course, four interceptions. Normally, you don't look to be ahead after you throw that many in one half. They have only thrown six the whole season coming into today's game. Earlier today, a drum competition. We'll be back with more in a moment. Today's game is brought to you in part by Office Depot. What you need, what you need to know. We're in Atlanta. We're at halftime of the Peach State Classic, and we're going to go down to the field for our halftime entertainment and the sounds of the game from South Carolina State in Orangeburg, South Carolina, the Marching 101, 180 strong under the direction of Ron Sargent, who's in his 28th year. The young ladies who dance with the band are the Champagne Dancers. Let's enjoy the South Carolina State Marching 101.
the men in rowing. The 101 will cheer you up as they take you to States marching 101 under the direction of Ronald Sargent and the Champagne Dancers. And we're at halftime here at the Peach State Classic between the Aggies and Bulldogs. We'll be back with more sounds of the game from the Georgia Dome in Atlanta in a moment. At halftime here at the Georgia Dome for the second annual Peach State Classic, I'm Charlie Neal along with Jay Walker and Let's look at our first half stats brought to you by Office Depot. What stands out in your mind? I mean, obviously, you know, you got to notice the turnovers right here. Four interceptions thrown by a quarterback that only threw six all year. He's thrown four interceptions. The time of possession, obviously, a and came in here wanting to control the clock a little bit. They've done a pretty good job of doing that with five minutes, uh, five minute advantage there. Penalties have become a key in the game, but not really. But the most important stat, that one a and turnover was a costly one because South Carolina State managed to turn that into a touchdown. A&T's only converted in the field goals. One field goal after that, after four turnovers and that's uh, if anything is a credit to uh, what they've been able to do defensively that is South Carolina State there's our office depot halftime stats let's go down and enjoy the home band for this particular game the marching blue and gold with the blue and gold marching machine from North Carolina A&T in Greensboro North Carolina you saw earlier Dr. Johnny Hodge being interviewed by Nicole Watson and the golden delight of the young ladies who dance with the marching machine from Greensboro, North Carolina, the blue and gold marching machine of North Carolina A&T. Halftime entertainment at its best. No one blows like the blue and gold. Ladies and gentlemen, be sure and catch the moving drum line this December. The movie will feature a blue and gold marching band called Atlanta A&T. Tonight, before the movie, you get to see and hear the real thing. The North Carolina A&T Staters, the blue and gold marching machine, the band known nationwide as the small band with a big sound. Listen to the sound of North Carolina A&T. No one blows like the Aggies.
to the music of the Jacksons and Torture. The band was also selected in Sports Illustrated as one of the top 10 bands in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, the marching band served as the honor band for the entire state of North Carolina and was recognized by the White House for excellence in halftime entertainment. When you're watching a and you're watching the very best. No matter where you go tonight, you won't see anyone as beautiful and talented as Golden Delight under the leadership of Miss Tiffany Brown and Miss Coffee Zara. have to be inflated to 13 pounds. A lot of times the team will underinflate or overinflate the ball, so this one's inflated to 8 pounds. And we got out here with the ball guys. And where are your ball guys at? Hey, that's what I got to do. Find them Find right them. now. Are the guys? Coach! Excuse me. Coach, who's that, Coach? I need four ball guys. I need them now. Before. You haven't even actually had a pregame of balls, all right. You two need never done it. have never done it before. Well, now, what does that mean? Now, so now we will see what kind of instruction uh, we gonna do today. Yeah, we, we talked to him for the good, so I think I think that will be all right. So you're gonna stay with whoever is at this end of the field, going downfield, and you're gonna stay if we're going this way with who's ever going up the field. Okay? I explained it to you. Now, what we get out of this, I guess we're gonna have to work on. Tackled by number 19. 
Jackson and Jesse Owens. Again, I want to thank all y'all for a good job today. Uh, a good communication, uh, good mechanics, good hustling. Uh, that is the mark of good officiating. All right, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. And we know we're critical. I know I said at home, go, hey, that was a terrible call. But Black College Sports has some of the best officials in the game. And Charles, you know a little bit about that. You were out here making a few calls yesterday, right? Oh, yeah. I always make a good good call. I don't I don't throw the flag unless I know what I'm talking about. Kind of look like a referee. <laughs> and we saw Anise Kennedy in there, the first female official in one AA football. She worked uh, this whole season with the Mid East Athletic Conference. Congratulations to her, Sam Jones, and the whole crew. Your thoughts on the first half, Jay? I think that both teams came out and played tremendously well. Mm -hmm. I think the South Carolina State capitalized on their turnover. North Carolina A and T, their turnovers kept them in the game. The one interception out of all the interceptions that McCampbell threw in the first half, the one that's cost it was the one he threw down in the red zone because right. you take points off the board. All right, let's look at some of the highlights from the first half, and we started off here with Reese McCampbell going to the air, and here's the loach. He stands up under the air. I mean, it was more or less the loach was the receiver more so than his own receiver. The loach made a great play on the ball there. Then McCampbell just forced the ball in the coverage there. Recurring theme in the first half, rolling out here, ball underthrown here. Defensive back Horton does a good job of coming back to the football, and then you see McCampbell here. This is the cost of one here. Down, teams driving in, going to put some points on the board near the end zone. You're throwing an interception. Instead of getting three or six, you get zero. And a good job on the return there by the Aggie defender. Especially in the red zone area. And, of course, here we go with the fumble by North Carolina a and Big Pula picks it up in the end zone. And South Carolina State gets more points added on on the only costly, real costly mistake that the Aggies made so far. We're at halftime here. And we have a three-point ball game, 12-9. to We'll be back second half from the Peach State Classic in Atlanta in just a moment. All of our students. To learn more about the MEAC, visit our website, MEACsports.com, and support your favorite team. You're watching an NBC Sports Prediction. Coach, tell us about the second half. Have you told your team to capitalize on the turnovers that have existed with South Carolina State? Well, we try really hard. Um, it's tough to get some consistency. They're crowding the line of scrimmage. Uh, we think we can throw the football with some consistency in the, in the second half, but we really would like to establish a run as well as try to run some options. So uh, hopefully we'll do a better job of sustaining our block. On the defensive side, do you have the stamina to keep up the pressure? Yeah, we've got to, I think so. Uh, we've got to tackle better. Uh, we can't grab tackle. We've got to we really put those hats through them and make some rock'em, sock'em tackles out there and uh, keep playing in the secondary like we planned. I thought we did a good job back there. All right, good luck right. in the second half, Coach. Thank, Thank you so much. All right, Charlie J. Rock'em, sock'em. <laughs> that's, that's what he needs to do. And talking about establishing a running game, Jay, when you look at the first half stats, the Aggies have run the ball one more time than South Carolina State, but they have 45 less yards in rushing in the first half. And that's because South Carolina State has had explosive running plays. Not to say South Carolina State has run the ball better, but they've had more explosive running plays. The Aggies haven't been able to do a long, sustained drive with those explosive runs. They've had a lot of four or five yards. What you're going to get from Bill Hayes' coach team, they haven't had the big explosive play that could be coming in the second half. Longest run for the Aggies in the first half was a 15-yarder by Jamal Jones, and I believe that was on an end-around play. Yeah, a little bit of trickery there. They ran a reverse with the misdirection, whereas we saw numerous plays there for South Carolina State. Jamie Scott with a 29-yard run for South Carolina State. Of course, McCampbell, three of ten in the passing department. Department three to his own team. He threw four to the opposing team. Not something you want to see. No, it's not. I mean, more importantly, he's throwing 30% right now. Three of 10, 30% ratio for the guy that's leading the conference in pass efficiency, as well as he's one of the tops in the nation. So something's going wrong there. Look for some halftime adjustments. Give him some easier throws to make. See if he can improve on that statistic there. It's only the good thing about it. He can only go one way from that first half, and that's up. He sure can. Yeah. Yeah. If he unless he throws five in the second half, he won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. As we get ready to start the second half, you see the Aggies of North Carolina and T will be kicking off to the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. DeBryant. That is Jamie Scott. He fields it at the one-yard line. And he's cut down at the 16. Checking out some other standings in Black College 
athletics today. The Southwestern Athletic Conference in the East. Alabama and m have assured themselves at least a tie for the East. And if they should prevail today in their final game in Jackson State, even if Jackson State beats Alcorn later tonight here on NBC, Alabama and m in head-to-head competition will come out victorious and represent the East in this SWAC championship game in Birmingham December 14th. Of course, Grambling has already wrapped up the West, but they have the big game coming up against Southern down in the Bayou Classic next Saturday. And, of course, you never know what the outcome of that's going to be. That's such a rivalry. Yeah, it just depends on what kind of roux they use to make the gumbo that week. Let's say the tournament's <laughs> going now. It's a little bit of a thicker roux than Southern tends to do better. If you got one of those water-based rubs, a little bit more crab and sausage in there, that favors Grambling a little bit. You know, this is... Uh, this week in the MIAC, the race a whole lot clearer than it was a week ago, right? <laughs> it, is. it is. We had so many scenarios last week, we didn't know which way was up, did we? The thing about it, if we just would have followed our history like we do with the stock, follow the historical price of it, you would have known that it was going to come down to that Florida class, the last game of the year in Florida. It's been that way for the past three years, am I right? And this makes it year number four. All right. On second down, McCampbell, escapability, but not too far and he was hit by Sean Jones who already picked up a penalty for a face mask on McCampbell in the first half. Sean Jones one of those guys he just likes to hit quarterbacks I think if he could he'd come up here and hit me right now if he could. <laughs> he likes to hit the six foot two sophomore out of Raleigh North Carolina chasing down the quarterback but I do respect the linebacker that makes the quarterback pay when he wants to run outside of the pocket. It is a third down third and three for the Bulldogs. And on the reverse, getting around the right side is Willis Ham. And Willis Ham picks up the first down across the 45 to about the 47 yard line, 24 yards on the run. On the reverse by Mr. Ham. One of the reasons this reverse was able to be successful, look how many people North Carolina A&T has within five yards of the line of scrimmage with man-to-man -man coverage on the outside. They're going to bring Ham along the outside. If he can get past this initial line of scrimmage, there's nobody sitting in the middle of the field waiting to tackle him here. One block away from taking that thing into a big play. Could have been a 70-yard touchdown there, but they did a good job of shedding off the block that Aggie defender did. But when you blitz, misdirection can throw you off. And those type of runs is what has helped them in the far as the numbers are concerned in the rushing department that is South Carolina State today. Here's Jamie Scott. He's not going to get away Look at that play this time there. from <laughs> Maurice Utley. Maurice Utley is right there. He's continuing where he left off in the first half. He's attacking the football. He, he, he can tell. He knows the magnitude of this game. He knows what it's like to play in one of these South Carolina State, North Carolina A&T games. He's a sophomore. He's played this game last year. He knew what to expect. He's carrying the Aggie defense on his shoulders right now by himself. Been busy all day, hasn't he? Among linebackers in the conference, Maurice Utley came into the game ranked fourth in tackles. Second down at 15. We may have a delay of game. Yes. Delay on the offense. Five yard penalty. Repeat second down. South Carolina State, only their fourth penalty of the ball game. The Aggies have been penalized six times in the contest so far. Here's a little bit of trivia that's always thrown me off. In the college football game, you have a 25-second clock, correct? In the NFL football game, you have a 40-second clock. Pros should be better at reading defenses and coverages. Why don't they college games have a 40-second clock? Something to think about. All right. I will. <laughs> Burgess on the reception. And Burgess back to the original line of scrimmage. More Before the Campbell completed that pass to one of his own players. <laughs> yeah. Burgess came into the game as with 23 receptions, four touchdowns receiving. He also runs the ball quite a bit from that. He's almost like a slot wingback type combination because he runs the ball almost as much as he catches passes. Football player we call it. Yeah. But Campbell again going on the fade down the sideline. In and out of the hands 
hands of Metcalf. He had it, and it was broken up at the last minute by Jason Horton. Horton got away with one there. I mean, if that ball's thrown just a yard in front, or even a yard behind, or with a little bit more zip, Horton was beat here. You see Metcalf does a good job of beating Horton initially off the line of scrimmage. It's just a foot race here, and Metcalf has those long legs striding out. Horton looked back at the last moment, managed to get a hand in there and then strip Metcalf's hands away from him. Fourth down. That'll bring on the punting unit for South Carolina State. That'll bring on Corey Brandenburg and a very disgusted Metcalf over on the sideline. to get a penalty flag he won't get an acting get a job in the acting school for that <laughs> <laughs> on the return for the Aggies, oh what a block it's Curtis Deloach Deloach down the sideline and out of bounds in front of the Aggie bench what a block and what a run back by Deloach 41 yards on the punt Curtis and the return by Deloach time out on the field and here's the punt by Brandenburg See, that was an acting job there. <laughs> The Classics will clash on NBC Network's Classic Clashes. Catch the games. Classic Clashes, Saturday, November 30th on NBC. Hayes, head coach of the Aggies of North Carolina A&T, 13th coach at the school, spent 12 years at Winston-Salem with a record of 89-42, needs five wins to hit the 200 club and join active coaches Billy Joe and Bullet Bailey. Bullet Bailey of Virginia Union, of course, Billy Joe down at Florida A&M, first and 10 for the Aggies at their own 46-yard line. Here's Hudgens off the left side. And there's that false daylight that we were talking about. It looked like there was a hole there, and all of a sudden the daylight was shut out. <laughs> yeah. He's tapping himself. He had a little bit of daylight to the outside. Yeah. But he, yeah, he went up. That's what I said. That's that false daylight he was on. He thought it was inside, and it wasn't. He even knows that. <laughs> he'll, keep running. he'll start getting the feel. It's an instinct. You have to be an instinctive runner. He's got the physical capabilities. He's just got to work on those college-level instincts. Marshall Glenn in at quarterback, second down and two. Hitting in motion. Here's the pitch back to Hudgens. Trying to get to the first down marker, and he's going to be short by about a yard. Where to be third down and one. Harrison on the stop defensively for South Carolina State. Now that you've got the North Carolina A&T offense in the past, getting a third and one or second and short was a no-brainer. It was a gimme for them all the time. Now they're a little bit more finesse. They spread you out a little bit more. They have to really work hard in order just to beat you up a little bit. That's a little bit different when the changes Coach Hayes has to make. But he said, hey, I'm getting used to this spread offense, too. I haven't been coaching this long. But once I figure it out, I'm going to master it. To give to Hudgens trying to get outside. He has been trapped back there and he will not get around the corner. And coming up to make the stop defensively, Greg Brown, the sophomore out of Gainesville's East Side High. There you see him right there. He started as a freshman a year ago, and he made a great defensive play that time. This has got to be power football. You have to have the ability just to run straight ahead. They're doing pulling traps, and Greg Brown just strung it outside. And just continued to attack the ball carrier there, running backwards. You can't do that at all, because even if you wouldn't have gotten it on third and one, if you run right to the line of scrimmage and fall down fourth and one, you can put your team in a position where they may decide to go for it. Matthews back to punt it, standing at his own 30. The ball is snapped along the ground. Goolsby will field it at the 25. Goolsby up across the 35 to the 37-yard line. A 27-yard punt by Matthews and Goolsby on the return. 8.32 remaining third quarter. Still a three-point ball game, 12-9. The Bulldogs ahead. Ebenezer Baptist Church, very famous church here, of course, in Atlanta. And 
tomb of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 1929 to 1968. First and 10 South Carolina State right now. Leading by three, 12 to nine, and the ball at their own 37. Campbell gives it to his running back, goes straight ahead. Let's look at our NBC trivia question of the week. Which team represented the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference in the inaugural Heritage Bowl back in 1991? We'll have the answer for you a little later on. All you have to do to log on and try to answer yourself to www.mbcnetwork.com. After a gain of three, it'll be second and seven at the 40 for South Carolina State. Jamie Scott is the lone setback back there. McCampbell with a pump fake, throwing down the middle. And there is interference because the defender had his back to the ball, but I don't know. It's going to be offense. I, don't, I was going to say, I don't know about that one because I don't know if it's going to be defensive or offensive because Metcalf was going after the ball. The defender, he ran into the defender. Now, was he impeded? That's what you have to look at. It looked like he shoved the defender is what I thought. Well, you were right, Jay. <laughs> Offensive pass interference. I was going to say, I didn't think it was defensive. Yeah, it could, could have been defensive. As you see here, Metcalf is going to push him out the way as the defender's getting ready to jump for the football. Metcalf plays a little bit of defense of his own. He pushes the defensive back out of the way there. Not bad. As a quarterback, you hate to see that penalty as a coach. But as a quarterback, you don't mind your wide receiver stopping you from throwing an interception. Yeah, you don't want that Offensive fifth one. Offensive pass interference. 15 yards from the previous spot. Down. Daniel Evans, our referee, Daniel O'Brien, Jerry Taylor, Ralph Newell, Richard Martinez, Willie Robinson, and Cornelius Wallace. Those are our officials today as assigned by the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. Johnny Greer, who's the coordinator of football officials. Lou Grillo, coordinator of men's basketball officials. And Bill Whitey, Whitus, the coordinator of women's basketball officials in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference is getting ready for our second season basketball right after football ends right here on NBC. Second and 22 after the offensive pass interference penalty. McCampbell again going upstairs. Now he's going to take off. He gets a block from Jamie Scott and he's tripped up after he gets across the 30 to about the 35 yard line. Coming up defensively for the Aggies is Joey Lance. You know, this is one of those plays where McCampbell, we've heard him talk about the scout report. Every now and then, he'll kind of take care of himself a little bit. He's got a wide receiver that's running open down the field. What McCampbell's going to do is just buy some time. He's buying time not to get off a pass. He's buying off time so he can find the running lane so the defenders can get further and further downfield. His so wide receiver's open downfield, but he's anticipating the run. And that's what I think has been the knock on him this year. He's not as patient as he should be as a quarterback. He'll take off quicker than you really want him to, but he has a first down now into the secondary and he tripped the sniper got him. a sniper from the astroturf there's a guy that sits down there under the astroturf at every arena and pull gets up just as you get ready to make that cut and pulls your foot down <laughs> he does a good job of making the tackle at an opportune time in that turf here running that turf you really have to make sure you pick your feet up because the turf doesn't have a lot of give it'll stick and as he breaks it here we got a nice look here look at this running in pure daylight oh no he just <laughs> fell down that turf has a lot of friction in it <laughs> 23 yards on the run by McCampbell and a first and 10 at the 41 yard line of the Aggies of a and 630 the time remaining we're in the third quarter play action again McCampbell keeping it still on his feet and gets another first down or close to it and he's close to the 30 yard line but we have a penalty flag down and we have another one down this is a dead ball we have a face mask possibly looks like one of the South Carolina State linemen went over there and saw an Aggie defender standing by the pile and he decided to just try and pile drive him into the turf and he got caught doing it. Well, let's see what our referee Daniel Evans. Got a dead ball, unsportsmanlike conduct on the offense. That's the one you were talking about. Yeah, there was the one, there was the one, what the one referee did, he made sure that everybody saw the flag go up. He threw it twice. First time he just dropped it, second time. Oh, he, he just threw it. Threw it. Oh, okay, it was the same flag. Yeah, same flag. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, sometimes they carry three or four flags in case they see three or four flags. <laughs> yeah, they'll drop a hat on you and everything else. <laughs> see, I've seen the referee, seriously, throw the flag, drop his hat, and then use his whistle to mark the spot of the fumble afterwards. Hey, you use whatever tools you have, right? <laughs> So the discussion going on with the Aggie defense. The defensive captain on the for the Aggies is Ivan Butler. Look look at him right here. Look at Big Fella coming there, watching the play. It's clearly over. That's why we, as football terminology we say when you're standing around that pile, keep your head on a swivel. Always look to your left, look to your right. Somebody could be coming for you. They were measuring to see if first down was made. And it is not enough for the first down. Let's just recap the season and how the things went for South Carolina State this year. They started the season with a win over Tennessee State by six. They forced seven turnovers in that game. They beat Dick in the game we did in Columbia, 52 to seven. Campbell ran for one through for two. They lost to Wolford by one point. They had won seven straight dating back to last season before that loss. Then they beat Savannah State 50 to 12, FAMU 31 13, and then North State 35 9. Then Norfolk State to a minus eight yards rushing. But then things started to fall apart. They had won five of their first six games. They lost to Bethune for 21 to 6, three turnovers in that game. Sue ran for 192 yards for Bethune. They beat Hampton in overtime 47 41, lost to Delaware State 27 21. They turned the ball over five times in that contest and trailed 21 0. Uh, they were held at just 67 yards rushing against Delaware State. Lost to Howard 23 to 9, had the ball less than 17 minutes in that game. Jay Colbert for Howard rushed for 187 yards and they lost to Morgan last week 23 12 Starlings 177 yards and three touchdowns and they were held 177 total yards just 49 passing so that's how the season has been for the Bulldogs the Campbell on the train to Jamie Scott and Jamie Scott will not get anywhere as Horton was there to make sure yeah good job they tried to do a little trickery here have everybody flood the zone on the left side throw a screen back to the right side one person all you need on one person on the defensive side of football to figure out what you're doing on trick play and they can ruin the timing of the whole play in that case there Horton came in from the corner made a great tackle on the play so to bring up a third down and 16 the ball at the 46 in there in oh. trouble <laughs> well you didn't you felt that one didn't you <laughs> I saw it. I mean you know you don't ever want to see a guy get hit like that that's Marv Blackstock that came up to make the stop a good pass rusher strong young man out of Moorhead High School in Eaton, North Carolina. Fifth sack for him this season. Yeah, I could feel it coming. As a quarterback, <laughs> I still have that clock going on in my head. So from the time the ball snapped, you have to have that mental clock saying, okay, first read, my second read, my third read, I got to go. In that case, he said, one, two, three, uh, let me look for four. And Mr. Blackstock said, there's no four. The fourth <laughs> yeah. option is a sack. So right. now they got to punt the ball. Never explosive is the loach. And here's Brandenburg back to put away. He don't fake it. He doesn't do the acting job this time. Deloach does not fair catch, but there's a flag down. He may have gotten or caused one of his teammates to have an illegal block. A times at that 22-yard punt by Brandenburg, return people will set up their offensive people to fail, <laughs> their blockers to fail. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. they're trying to help you out, don't know which way you're going, and they get caught hitting somebody in the back who was facing you just a second ago, you know? All of a sudden, they turned their back on you. I mean, Curtis Deloach, he's an explosive player. There. One thing's about him, he plays cornerback. Big catch and interference on the kicking team. They were in the two-yard belt. No contact. It's a ten-yard penalty from the front of the circle. Get back to Deloach. He plays cornerback at 6'4", 225 pounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I was talking to the defensive coordinator, Coach Ashita, I said, that's not a cornerback. That's a safety you have playing corner. And they're violating the halo rule there just because Deloach trying to make a play happen. So it you, certainly is. You know, things like that happen. It's a free yard if you're North Carolina a &T. The Aggies started the season with a loss to North Carolina Central. Their cross-state ride, 33-30 in they overtime. Kick catch and interference on the kick it team. The 10-yard penalty from the beginning of the circle where he entered the circle. 
They beat Jackson State 42-36, and they forced six turnovers there. You know, Kent threw five touchdown passes for 540 yards. They lost to Portland State in overtime 23-20. Had a 14-0 lead and let that slip away. And they gave up 207 yards to a young man by the name of Ryan Cuba. We'll be back. We're in the third quarter. We have a three-point game. With 419 left in the third quarter, 12 to 9, our score is South Carolina State over the Aggies of North Carolina AT and the Aggies with the ball at their own 27-yard line. Second possession, second half for the Aggies. We asked you earlier which team represented the MIAC in the inaugural Heritage Bowl in 1991. It was the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. They beat SWAC representative Alabama State 36-13. Aggies finished that season 9-2. And, and meanwhile, South Carolina State has appeared in the Heritage Bowl three times. They did it in 93, 94, 97, winning one and losing two. And they're talks about trying to re-establish the Heritage Bowl between the SWAC and the MIAC champ. Here's Glenn throwing incomplete over the head of the intended receiver downfield, Robert Booker T. Washington. Good pressure being applied by Eugene Williams, defensive end from South Carolina State. Did a good job of not allowing Marshall time. The wide receiver was open, but he had to rush the throw there. Things about Marshall, good looking prospect. Once he adds a couple pounds to his frame, he's going to be something else. He's got a great arm right now. He's got that presence about him that you don't expect out of a true freshman. Like I say, Bill Hayes just loading up the oh, yeah. cupboard, isn't he? <laughs> yes, he is. He was a team. He took his team to the 4A semifinals last year in high school at East Mecklenburg down in Charlotte. He's back to pass again under pressure. He's going to be dropped for a loss. And coming in is Ken Jones. Make the stop along with Chandler. They bought the blitz from the weak side, and Marshall didn't know. Marshall Glenn didn't understand where the blitz was coming from. They brought two linebackers coming weak. You're going to take a look here from this side here. you got a defensive lineman, Drake Poole, the linebacker, shooting the gap from the outside. You've got two defenders trying to block three rushers. Numbers, gonna, numbers are always going to win in that case there. Poole did a good job on the blitz. And back to punt once again. Yannick Matthews. Bullsby is the deep man. Bullsby will field it at the 37. Trying to dance outside. Still on his feet. And struggles to the 49-yard line. Bullsby on the return after a 42-yard punt. South Carolina State will get the ball just shy of midfield with 2.38 to go in the third. 9 our score. Start your day with power and praise on an NBC network for inspirational program featuring some of the most dynamic ministries in the country. Tune in to Empower Ministry, Mondays through Fridays and Sundays beginning at 5 a.m. on NBC. The Family's Urban Network for inspirational programming. So a shot of Bill Hayes there. You know, another distinct honor that he has, if you want to call it an honor or pleasure that he has, he's one of only three coaches to never lose to Eddie Robinson. Wow. He's never lost to Eddie Robinson. He's 3-0 and o against Eddie Robinson. Pete Richardson also never lost to the coach at Southern. And Joe Taylor beat Eddie Robinson in his last home game at Grammar. Why did Joe do that? <laughs> <laughs> Why did Joe do that? And I'll tell you this to speak up for Coach Rob. I know that uh, they lucky they caught him towards the end of the career. Because in his peak, if they would have played Eddie Robinson three times, you probably were going to lose two out of three. No question. Of course, uh, Buddy you replaced the legend here in Will Jeffries, who spent uh, 19 years here. He spent five at Howard, five at Wichita State, State, and has the best record in the conference history. Second down and eight. McCampbell goes out in the flat. Burgess has it. Burgess down at the 45-yard line. It'll be about five yards shy of the first. It'll bring up a third and five, and we're down to 149 remaining in the third quarter. That's, that's great defense there by the North Carolina a and Aggies. That's what you want to do. Let them catch the ball in front of you and then swarm to the football. Don't have just one person making the tackle. Have the whole secondary there. McCoy get over there. Park and the strong safety. Pittman then throw in a little linebacker play there coming over from the weak side. Sean Jones, those guys. That's how you play swarm defense. McCampbell 
13 rushes, 53 yards, all in the second half. And there's a completion of seam down the middle to Burgess. He's on his feet. Burgess at the 10 and out of bounds, finally. And a flag is going to be thrown on the Aggies of A&T. Burgess with a great run and catch. You're talking about run after catch. 35 yards from Burgess. As you see here, they're going to bring blitz here. One, two. All the wide receivers Burgess is going to do here is replace the gap where they leave and then do a little dance on the outside here. Just to replace it. It's a hot read there. Once you catch the ball, you split the defenders, and then you turn on the Jets when you get to the outside, running hard down the field, and then the, the face mask came on the sideline right there in front of the official. He didn't miss it. That is his longest catch this year was 67 yards, that one was 35. At the end of the run, five yards. You said that was a 35-yard catch. How long was that actual pass? Maybe That's knowing your responsibility. 12, 12. Seven yard pass. Seven yards let him run for 28 yards or 32 yards. You throw the ball to the right person when they blitz you. When you blitz, if you get the ball to the right person where the weakness is, the big plays can happen for you. The ball was actually in the air 12 yards because the quarterback had to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you take this. You always take these way. First and goal. <laughs> And the Aggies, I believe, jumped. So that's going to bring it half the distance closer. Two and a half yards closer than where the ball is now. So another penalty on the Aggies. You know, coming into the game, we talk about all the interceptions that the Aggies uh, had had. Let's listen. Before the snap, outside on the defense, had the distance penalty repeat now. That the defensive backs had 16 of 20 interceptions coming in to this particular year a year ago. Already this year, 22 of the 26 interceptions by the Aggies have been by the DBs. Four in this game. Yeah, they've got great DB play out there. And this is a young group of defensive backs, too. They'll be around, except for Horton, who's a senior. Basically, the secondary will be back intact next year. First and goal from the two. And it's Scott, Jamie Scott. He walks us in unmolested and untouched by human hands. Oh, fantastic block there by Ken Bowie Maxwell to help spring Scott to the outside there. They lined up the full house backfield there. Maxwell sealed the outside where Scott looked like he'd be in trouble. All of a sudden, Maxwell just pummeled the defender, creating a wide open running room for Scott to go in untouched. 51-yard drive. Believe it or not, out of all the scoring we've had, we've only had two drives, long drives, that resulted in touchdowns today offensively. And that was the first one by the Bulldogs, and this one. And here for the point after is Guy DiPaolo. Trying to stretch the lead even more. The kick is up, and it is good. They rejoice when he makes one. Anyway, that makes it a 19-9 to ball game. This is with 38 seconds to go. Maxwell with a cut block there. Once he just cut that wide, number 21, he took his angle away from Horton. Didn't let Horton attack upfield the line of scrim. He cut the receiver, the defensive back's legs from him, allowing room on the outside. Let's look at the Division II playoffs. Out of town scores. And we saw that Fayetteville State was playing Carson Newman today, the Division II playoffs. And Carson Newman came out victorious. Fayetteville State representing the SCIAA, rather. And Delaware uh, State ends its season on a positive note, 14-7 over Howard. Morgan State, great job for Coach Hill Ely. They beat Hampton this day on the final game of the season, 52-42. Norfolk State comes out victorious over Morris Brown, 32-19 in Norfolk. Three in a row, three in a row for them. And right now, the second quarter, the Phil Cookman leading Florida a &M down in Orlando by a score of 10 to nothing. Bethune Cookman, of course, trying to go 11 and 1 in for the season at the SWAT Alabama AM. They have assured themselves a berth in the SWAC championship. They beat Arkansas by love by 20 today. So they will represent the East Division against Grambling December 14th down in Birmingham. From the 10 yard line, Hudgens. And Hudgens out to the 29. This is so good for, for football in general. When a lot of things come down to the last week of the season, you have to get excited about it from a football perspective, especially that Bethune, Florida, and their matchup. That's going to be interesting there. As good a job as Coach.
coach Wyatt has done. It all came down to one week, motivating your troops. And he had new coach, Coach Hayes told him, he gave him a little pep talk down there, getting ready for that game against Florida a &M. Oh, yeah. He said that Wyatt was kind of concerned. Oh, I lost Super, and I don't know what I'm going to do. He's hurt, he's hurt. <laughs> coach Hayes told him, you just better coach what you have. Stop <laughs> you can't worry about what you don't have, right? <laughs> you can't worry about what you don't have. Hayes, you know, he got a little attitude. Like, I'm tired of hearing you complain about it. <laughs> Here's a reverse by the Aggies, and now a pass is going to be thrown downfield, but the receiver slowed up. The receiver slowed down Kenny Perry. I don't know if he thought it was going to develop, but I'll tell you one thing. The Bulldogs weren't fooled defensively because everybody stayed home. Yeah, they were playing zone coverage. And when you have zone coverage, your job is just to take care of your, field, your position on the field. Take a look at Gators here. His job is to not let anything get behind him. You get caught if you peek in the backfield here. He's just going to continue to run. He's got no responsibility over here. Everything deep. Everything because of a good job of staying at home. Zone coverage. He was waiting there playing center field. Almost at the seven. Good job of playing zone coverage by Gathers. Coming back on the inside, and again, with the exception for the fir that fumble in the first half, a t has played almost airless football, and Douglas is back in at quarterback. He started the game. He's given away to Jason uh, Marshall Glenn, who's played uh, most of the second and third quarters. The third quarter has come to an end here in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta, the Peach State Classic. And as we go into the fourth quarter, it's a 10-point lead for South Carolina State, 19-9. As we start the final 15 minutes here of regulation at the Georgia Dome, we're looking at a third down and six for the Aggies of North Carolina a and They trail it by 10 after the touchdown run by Scott, a two-yard run. That stretched the lead to 19-9 to with 38 seconds to go in the third. As we mentioned, Jason Douglas back in as the quarterback for the Aggies. Roll right. Throwing on the run. And it's caught on the far sideline, and they're going to call it incomplete. They're going to call this one an incomplete pass. It was in and out of the hands of Booker T. But Booker had it, but I think he came down out of bounds. They just ran out a little bit of real estate. He's got to do a better job of presence of knowing how close he is to the sideline. Geared down a little bit so your quarterback has more room to throw. See him there. He's got the out route. Now, start to slow down. Stop drifting. He stretches out and just landed out of bounds. It's a matter of if the right foot would have down first, they would have called it good. The left one came down first out of bounds. Incomplete pass on third down. So it brings up a fourth down punting situation. Now, timeout call. He must not have had enough people on the field for them to call the timeout. Let's recap some of the highlights from the third quarter. Here is a big hit on McCampbell. And, of course, everybody's happy when you make a hit to a quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> It'll go there. The kicker got excited about the little kick there. They brought the reverse around to the outside of Ham. Punished the tackle there at the end by Horton. And then you'll take a look here. The, look at the hits coming up. Look at the big lineman trying to get a hit at the end there oh, yeah. on the excited part of the turn there by Deloach. And then the swarming Bulldog defense. The curve thing been all over Hutchinson all day today. And then you see here McCampbell springing himself free down there, tripping, losing his traction there. And then on the outside, the great seal block there by Maxwell. Scott going into the end zone untouched. Those are the easy ones right there. The oh, untouched yeah. touchdown. Man, oh, man. Makes the game look easy sometimes. Pritchard, Pritchard was also out there blocking. Remember, Pritchard has a touchdown. He scored the first touchdown in the ball game on a three-yard run with 8-19 to go in the first quarter. So on the fourth down punting situation, you're looking at Goolsby back to receive the punt of Yannick Matthews. Matthews has been busy today. Seven punts and three field goals. Good kick. Vickers call for at the 25-yard line by Goolsby. Let's go down to the cold. All right, Charlie. We now, of course, Evander Holyfield. Everybody recognizes him, but he's also an executive for NBC. Tell us about, first of all, he's in Atlanta having everybody in her hometown for such an event. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good game for one thing. If you can bring all the people together with sports to show you how family's supposed to be. NBC is all about family programming. Tell us about, you know, 30 football games. You've got a lot of basketball games coming up. This is sports at its best. Well, it's definitely sports at its best. And, and to give these, 
give these young people opportunity to be on television. A lot of times you get up with, with, uh, with black colleges which don't get a chance uh, to be on television. Now they get a chance to be viewed, and a lot of other great athletes probably go to the, more of the university because they know they can get exposure and they can kind of reach their goal professionally if they like. For you, big fight December 14th, Chris Bird. I asked you when you are ready, you said, hey, I was born ready. <laughs> you were this guy, is he going to be a tough contender for you? Well, I'm telling you, Chris Bird is a good fighter, and uh, all, all good fighters are tough. But, you know, that's something that I, that's what I do. That's what I do professionally. It's something that I've been doing for 32 years, so ready? Yes, I am. <laughs> all right, you're also a great role model and someone to look up to for the folks here at NBC as well. We thank you for this event. Thank you. Charlie and Jay, the chain, we Vander. All right, and the pass complete to Metcalf, and Evander, of course, has the big fight coming up in Atlantic City on December 14th. That was the NBC version of the Lady and the Champ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a first down after a 19-yard pass completion to Terrence Metcalf. Here's Mr. Deloach, the defender on the play. He got caught looking, I believe, because they hit that quick slant, and they kind of uh, consistently. Look at the total yards here, 331 to 135. South Carolina State has dominated. Just think if they hadn't turned the ball over four times. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and ironically enough, only capitalization that A&T would have come up with was a field goal. Yeah, I mean, normally if you have 331 yards of total offense and just three quarters of football, you'd expect to have more than 19 points on the board. Turnovers have been costly. Give credit to A&T. They've had a bend, don't break type of defense today. And South Carolina State's going to look to capitalize more to give themselves a little bit more breathing room. A&T needs to stop here and a score to make it a one-possession game to put some pressure on the Bulldogs. Second down and nine. And Goldsby trying to go left on the reverse. Turns the corner close to the first down. Finally, the stop made defensively by McEachin. Billy McEachin, Red Springs, North Carolina. Don't forget later on, Shaw Bears and Cleveland Panthers from Raleigh, North Carolina. Basketball here on NBC. And we'll close out the day down in Jackson, Mississippi. Alcorn State and Jackson. Those two schools about 90 miles apart. The Capital City Classic always a good rivalry when Alcorn and Jackson get together. Third down and inches for the Bulldogs. We're going to full house backfield. <laughs> He can move. Look at the defense. They're 40. He can move. They act like he can't move. He can go in motion. You know, the defense stood there and pointing fingers rather than playing defense. And, and what was so funny about it was they were so surprised. Cam Louis Maxwell, he froze. It was like that picture we were doing the other day. <laughs> the posture there. If they were to look at this, they're standing up. If you snapped the ball right now, you would have caught them off guard. And well, they did, and they got the first down. And the whole line would have been off would have been caught off by surprise. But, yeah, in that case, they just were expecting a flag. Yeah. I mean, the man, you can have my man in motion. That's all he did was move laterally. He didn't come to one line of scrimmage. First down and ten. <laughs> Don't point fingers, but play defense. Here's a long pass. This could be an interception. Oh. The fifth interception. Stay there. <laughs> That's Horton. Where Charlie are you going? Coaching up here from the box. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> so Horton gets in on the act. It's been Deloach, Ravnell, McCoy, and Pittman. Today's game is brought to you in part by the Bryson Reeds program. 11.51 remaining here in the fourth quarter. 19-9, our score with the Bulldogs up on top of the Aggies. I want to thank all of you for your emails that you've sent to the NBC Network about our coverage of live black college sports. We've committed to bringing you more sports, more entertainment, more news information. If you like what we're doing, tell your family, then tell your friends more about us. Here's, that should be grounding. Grounding? No, outside the pocket. Well, let me see what they call the flag. Why is the flag on there? Think they might have got a hold on the outside trying to seal the perimeter there. Holding. It's the Aggies. Okay. He didn't have another flag to throw. <laughs> <laughs> so five different defensive backs have picked off Reese McCampbell today. He started with Deloach. Ravnell got one. McCoy, Pittman, and then Horton. So it's gone around the horn. Oh, yeah. 
yard penalty from the previous spot. Repeat the dial. I know we're getting close to the holiday season, but Reese is trying to play Santa Claus a little bit early today, isn't it? I know, I know, I know Coach Buddy Pugh is happy. You know, they talk about Buddy Ball is, is alive and well in Orangeburg. This is not what Buddy had in mind when he talking about Buddy Ball. We don't want to give, you know, just keep, you can't give teams six or five opportunities in a ball game. I mean, they're fortunate, like I said, to have not uh, had anything come back and fight them other than a field goal, a 35 yard. Here's Douglas in trouble, and he's going to rock the ball. And almost disaster again down near the goal line for North Carolina A&T. And fortunately, one of the offensive linemen was there to save the day. Major, the freshman center, Josh, out of Wilson High up in Washington, D.C. 17-year-old young man. Doug's going to do a throwback. He's going to do a rollout to the right. The whole time he knows he's going to throw this ball back to the left side. As he's rolling out to the right, getting ready to throw the ball all the way back across the field. It just was not going to happen on that play there. The defender might have not missed the number on that defender there, but he was on all the way. He didn't give time to set up. He's got to protect the football a little bit more as a quarterback. The play's not there. Hey, make it a bad play rather than a turnover. Could have easily been a turnover and a touchdown for South Carolina State. Second and 29. Hinton is in motion. Get out of the end zone. And that's complete on the near side, but nowhere to go because Brown was right there to make sure that the receiver, Hollingsworth, didn't pick up any additional yards. Yeah, I mean, he was dangerously close to getting the safety there. You know, in the end zone, get rid of the ball a lot quicker. The defense is coming. They smell blood. They want that safety there all the way. After you make the first guy miss, hurry up and get rid of it. That's too much time. I wouldn't have even attempted to run across the end zone that way. Get rid of the football there. Instead, you a long pass. You got your wide receiver hit pretty hard. Get that clock going in your head. Get that clock going. Throw the ball something quick. Get your timing and your rhythm together. 10 of 16, just under 100 yards. Throwing down the middle, and it's complete. What a tackle, but it's a first down to Kenny Perry across the 30 to the 32. Great catch. Fantastic catch. Kenny Perry ran in the post route on the inside. Douglas having the composure to stick with him here. It's just you're going to have a real route and a post route. As soon as he clears the second level of the field, he makes himself big. Catch the ball. You know you're going to get hit anyway. Just because you drop it, don't think the defensive back's not going to hit you. He caught the ball knowing he was going to get hit anyway. Good job of holding on to it. Kenley was the man who put the hit on him. Justin Kenley. First down. And now the delayed play, the draw to Hudgens. Hudgens for about six or seven yards. Up to the 39-yard line. You know, I was talking to Kareem Sanders, who's the right guard for the offense. They call him Big Baby. Uh, I asked him, I said, who was the toughest opponent you faced this year? And he said, Howard University. He said they were the toughest defense he felt he faced. And he, he said the, the, the kid named Woodall was the one who gave him fits in that game. Here's a long pass down the field. It's out of bounds, incomplete, intended for Jamal Jones. And he was being covered by Gathers downfield. I mean, you know, and that just depends in terms on who you're going to go against because obviously we've got some defensive linemen all throughout the conference that play fantastic. By him being a guard, you're going to look for some interior play. A lot of times the interior linemen get overlooked, like Woodall is a guy on paper is not going to show up with a bunch of sacks, but he's down there in the trenches compared to a guy like Isaac Hilton from Hampton who's just the sack monster of all of college right. football this mm -hmm. year. Third down conversions today. A&T. You see what they've done for the season in third down conversions? 26%, 41 of 169. Almost intercepted on the far sideline. Almost coming up with it was Gathers. He had it there. Look at the, the defensive coordinator, Robbie Wells, just gives him a hug. They're like, I understand, I understand. But that's a play you got to make there. I mean, you know, you got an opportunity to have it, to give your team the football on the 40 yard line. They're coming outside on the rollout pass here. You can't float this ball down there. You got to assume there's going to be somebody there. Gathers was actually going for the hit and ran into the football before he ran into the Aggie wide receiver going out for the pass. So a punting situation again for the Aggies who. For the fourth time on five interceptions, unable to turn it into any points. Goolsby the deep man, and this takes a South Carolina State bounce with 
8.48 to go in the fourth quarter. And it's a 10-point lead still for the Bulldogs of South Carolina State after a 31-yard punt. And we'll be back. To South Carolina State. He's catching on, Charlie. He's catching go. on. Play hard. Play rough. 3D's <laughs> Funk Studio, the funkiest video show and primetime television broadcast a special time next week. Tune in to Dennis's 3D, Scott, to for your hip-hop historian on four hot episodes of Funk Studio Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 p.m. right here on MBC as Kambui Maxwell gets the call that time. And Kambui picks up about eight yards across the 35 to about the 37. We saw that piece at halftime talking about why would teams want to play with a deflated football or inflated football. Right now, South Carolina State with a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter wants to play with that deflated football, the one that's hard to throw, hard to score a lot of points, but it's real easy to run. On second down and two. Again, Maxwell on the carry gets the first down across the 40. You know, South Carolina State, when you look back at the history of the Midwest and Athletic Conference, has placed more players or had more players named to the first team all conference than any other school in the Midwest and Athletic Conference, and that is 152. And you were part of those players that were named to the all conference team, first team. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to make it twice, as a matter of fact, back to back years. Tremendous honor. It's something you carry with you for a lifetime. You like getting those accolades from people in your conference. And Howard second behind South Carolina State with the number of players who've been first team all conference over the years. In fact, in 94, South Carolina State had 11 players who were ranked first team all conference. That's a lot of players. Metcalf, the intended receiver, Deloach was there defensively. And that's a good matchup there between Metcalf and Deloach. Both of these kids are six feet four inches tall. Deloach there showing some pretty good athleticism coming around Metcalf, getting the left arm in front of the ball coming his way. That'll bring up a second and ten. So coming into this season, Howard had put 103 players as first team all conference. Yeah, and we didn't, count you, on that. we didn't count you twice. You didn't either. count me twice. <laughs> give Hill a lot of credit for that sports information director because they have to get the players out there to receive the recognition. So right. the job hats off to those guys. Trying to set up the screen to Maxwell. They nice. have it in his hands. Nice. He has the first down and he's finally tripped up, but not before he gets inside the 45 to the 42 of the Aggies. 7.20 to go, 10-point game, 16-yard run for Cambui Maxwell. And that's how you draw it up there. On the screen, you just want to try and get everybody else to be in sync. You want to get a body on a body. Screen going to the left side. These guys are going to engage in blocks and get out here. As they engage in their blocks, they get outside, give them a lead entourage there, put a body on a body. A big offensive lineman against a small defensive back and just allow your running backs room to create space to get upfield. Nicely done. And there you look at Mr. Maxwell, Cambui Maxwell. First down and 10, South Carolina State again from the gun. Here's Maxwell again into the secondary, and Maxwell picks up about five, six yards. It'll be second down and four. It's a good hard runner there. You got Maxwell, a guy who likes to hold on to the football. He's got a low center of gravity. He's five feet nine inches tall compared to Smith, who's 5'11, 5'9, 210. Low, wide low, built close to the ground. One of the things that has to be happening and wearing on the Aggies, Jay, is the fact that their defense has played a lot of minutes out there. Yes, especially I mean, in they the played half. They, and they played extremely well, but you know they they've been out on the field a long time today. It is second down and six. They're trying to blitz and trying to determine the snap count from the quarterback. And there's some good sportsmanship there. And that's one thing you have to do with a team that's just running the ball right down the middle on. You have to get somebody else in the vicinity. So what North Carolina AT is doing is just trying to overload the box, blitzing gaps because they can't stop them with just a four-man front. That's why you have to blitz. Good teams don't have to blitz to stop the run. They can do it with a four-man front. That's his passing stats. He's got better stats running today. On third down. And there's Metcalf inside to the 15-yard line. Again, Deloach covering defensively, but Metcalf picks up the first down 20 yards on the pass. 
from the quarterback, McCampbell. Yeah, they've had a good battle going on all day. And every now and then we saw Deloach on the upper hand. Sometimes we see Metcalf coming back, too. They've gone at it pretty good all day from the opening series of the game there. As you see here, Metcalf does a good job of running routes like this anticipation, just drilling the slant pass in there or the skinny post pattern there. Do a good job just pitching it and catching it. It is first down and 10. Full house backfield for South Carolina State. Pritchard's back there. And here's Jamie Scott turning the corner to the right at the five. Bumped out at the one yard. Man, they say touchdown. They say it's a touchdown. He was bumped out by Ravenel, but he got it in. When the pylons move, you know that means a touchdown no matter how it gets there. That may be some sort of knockout blow, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we have Evander Holyfield has joined us up at the booth. He said he always wanted to do what I do. He wanted me to go in the ring and fight for him in December. So let's see what happens. <laughs> So Scott picks up his second rushing touchdown of the afternoon, and here's DiPaolo on for the point after to try to stretch the lead even more. High snap, kick is up, and it is good. 28 to 9 is our score. South Carolina State for the second straight year trying to knock off the Aggies. Here's Scott turning the corner, getting inside the pylon for six. Will you join yourself today? Uh, <laughs> I love the game. Love the game. It is. Exciting. And you're getting ready for that big fight coming up. Uh, you talked to Nicole earlier. You're already in training. When are you going to go up to AC? Well, I should go up a week before the fight. Right now, I still have my two more weeks. Okay. Network's going well. You're here today. Marlon's here. And Mr. Gary and Sussel went up to Raleigh, right? <laughs> you decided to stay home. Well, everybody got to do a little something. You know? <laughs> so I'm at home uh, and seeing this great game. So, you know, I got to Best part of it. Now let me ask you this. I know that as a football player, former football player, we all think we can box and do things like that. As a boxer, you think you could have been a great football player too? Well, I knew I could have been a great football player. They, they put me on the bench too long. What position would you have played? I would have played uh, uh, cornerback or uh, linebacker. I'm probably linebacker. Yeah, because you like hitting people. people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wait, turn around here. <laughs> Wait, so you like hitting people. <laughs> It's right up your alley, right? I, I, like, you know, I like to be in the mix of things. And then you figure it's a lot easier to hit somebody when you got some pads on compared to when you're out there boxing doing your day-to-day training where it's just leather hitting on the skin. Well, you know, you know, the difference is, is that in football you got you got other people to help you out. In boxing, you just have yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought that the atmosphere before a fight is like no other atmosphere in all the sports. Even as a football player, we go to a stadium with 70,000 people. They're here to see the whole team. If they pack an arena with 17,000 people there just to see you and one other person. That's describe right. that feeling. Well, it's, it's just a great feeling. It's hard to describe, you know, because uh, either you're winning or you're losing. And uh, you, you know, winner or loser, that, that's what boxing is all about. Douglas on the pass out in the flat has it complete. And picking up some yards across midfield and picking up the first down for the Aggies is Byron Bud Phillips on the reception. His first catch of the day. You saw a shot of Bill Hayes there coming into the game. He was seven and seven career-wise against South Carolina State. Looks like he's going to be seven and eight after today. Buddy Pugh gets his first one as head coach. Yeah, I mean they compete. And Pugh, it's fortunate enough to win his first Carolina Classic, but they'll be battling for years and years. Oh, to come. no question about it. But Douglas again. These are some young men. You're going to see and hear a lot of it in the next couple of years as this pass is complete and still running for additional yards for the Aggies is Doug Brown. And Doug Brown picks up a first down all the way inside the 30 to about the 27. And that one was good for 19. Let's go down to the cold. Thank you so much, Charlie. With me now is Dr. James Rennick. He is the chancellor for North Carolina a and And I love what you say about your students. You want to make sure you have great student athletes, those that are 
academically gifted as well as athletically, athletically talented. Right, the students come first. That's why we're at the university, is to make sure that these students get a high caliber, high quality education. And I love that. I love athletics. I love the competition. They're students first and athletes second. Now, what I love is the fact that you didn't come here in a suit and tie. You came here like Joe Van. Talk <laughs> about this rivalry and how great it is. Well, this rivalry is huge. I think it's going to just build year after year after year. We love coming to Atlanta. We love the Peach State Classic, and we're looking forward to the future. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Look at this, guys. You know he's all a and decked <laughs> out. Yeah. This yellow. Aggie Pride. Aggie Pride. He's ready to go. Deck up to the booth. All right. We know about that Aggie Pride. Jay, you deflated some of that pride one time, didn't you? <laughs> and I've been hearing about it ever since, too. Here's a pass out in the flat, and it's complete. And that is to running back Frank Patterson, who's come on, played some here. And it'll bring up a second down, second and eight after a two-yard gain. And a clean, the clock ticking down, 325, the time remaining, and a 17-point advantage for South Carolina State. Right and again, now. the Aggies have not been able to take advantage of any of the miscues of South Carolina State. And that has to change right now. they got to get a touchdown. A field goal won't do it. They've already kicked three of those. They need to get the ball in the end zone or at least make some attempts to go at the end zone. That was a good comeback catch by the receiver, Hollingsworth, but not enough to gain any additional yards. And we got a player injured down for the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. I think that's Gathers. And they're attending to him. Let's look at the long distance play of the game and see exactly when it happened. Here it is. Yeah, what you see here is just good football. They brought the blitz from the outside. Burgess recognized the blitz coming from the outside. Did it what he was supposed to do by catching the ball on the scene, turning on the Jets, explode to the outside, added a 15 yard penalty face mask on the tackle there, setting up the South Carolina State Bulldog. Could be the deciding big score. That touchdown there was crucial for our Verizon long distance play of the game. Saw Bill Hayes on the sideline. Of course, Buddy Pugh out looking at his player. That's see who that is. No, I, that is not gathers. Can't see the number. Defensively for South Carolina State. And you always want, especially the last game of the season, you do not want to see a player get injured. Yeah, that's true. And in any sports at all, from an athletic standpoint, you want to go out there and try your best. But, Tim, you can relate to this. You always want to respect your opponent and keep injury. You don't wish injuries on anybody. Exactly. Yeah, it's, you know, best team win and, of course, less injury and greater chance that you stay there a long time. That was Watley, the defensive back out of Douglas High, hometown young man from here in Atlanta. He's carried off. Third down and five facing the Aggies. Blix is coming. Steps up. Incomplete behind the attendant receiver. He was there and could have maybe taken it in. That was on the reception, Doug Brown. Well, that's that's one, who he was trying to hit. And that's one that they wish they could have back. That could have been a crucial. That could have been a touchdown they were looking for. Then an onside kick to make it a real competitive football game. You've got to go for it. You can't think about a field goal now with 2.34 to go. Even though it is fourth down and five, you can pick up the first down without scoring. They only have to get to the seven-yard line for the first down. Well, Evander, thank you for joining us. Much success to you. Wait a minute. Let me see this play here. Don't go anywhere. Let me see. They may score. It's fourth down. Okay. We'll, we'll go hold you for one more play. I'm the only person that can do that to Evander. And this is in the air. Incomplete. And the intended receiver just couldn't. Couldn't pick it up, Frank Patterson, and then they'll turn it over on downs with 229. Good luck to you, December 14th. Always you. great seeing you. Evander Holyfield with us here, 229 remaining in this contest. Set a 26-9 lead for the Bulldogs. We'll be back. The man still performing here, the Aggie man, even though their team is down by 17. Look at the long distance drive of the game. We're here. It was a team effort here. Metcalf set it up with a nice pass play to soften up the defense, and then they did some power running on the outside with Scott getting to the end zone. You loosen them up with the pass, then you hit them hard with the run for a long distance drive of the game. South Carolina State can run out the clock here and come out victorious. They can hold on. Ball, of course. 
Aggies started at their own 42, drove all the way down to the 13 of South Carolina State and turned it over on downs, unable to punch it in. They were unable to put a touchdown on the board today. Matthews kicked three field goals from 35, 35, and 42 yards out. They're on 13. Some new blood in the lineup for South Carolina State. Bring in some new running backs. Let them get a chance to touch the ball a little bit. Carrying the ball that time was Jermaine Brown. Second down and two, or well, eight after a gain of two, rather. Clock continuing to run down under two minutes. Chris Link also in a quarterback out of Central High in Bartow, Florida. He's a transfer from Iowa. And he hands off again on the carry. Jermaine Brown. And while we got a moment here to give credit where they do, this game, like we, we all know, the magnitude of this game will always grow over the years, and both teams are loaded. You got a tale of two teams right now. South Carolina State is loaded with experience. It's an experienced ball club, many seniors and juniors, North Carolina AT, many freshmen and sophomores. So next year, these roles could easily be reversed because Buddy Pugh's going to have to learn what it's like to have to reload the NBAC conference. No question about it. Be losing Metcalf. He'll be losing Aubrey Haynes on the offensive line. He'll be used losing Bobby Collins. The Campbell's back next year. Jamie Scott's a senior. Trevin Smith is just a junior. Willis Ham's a senior. You lose him. So you lose some of your core of your offense. One of the things that hit a and hard this year was a linebacking core. They lost their, their great linebacker from a year ago. But they didn't seem to miss a beat with the rest of the, the players. Uh, when I say they lost uh, the linebackers, you know, they lost four starters last year. They had 29 sacks uh, a year ago. They're doing the same thing again this year. And then on top of that, don't forget about the injuries they had. They had some linemen in the uh, offensive line that were lifting weights, and during the offseason, they lost a couple of their players, too. That really, really hurts. All right. So the clock gets down under 25 seconds. Bethune Cookman leading FAMU 23 to 10. That's in the fourth quarter of that big MEAC game down in Orlando. And should Bethune hold on, they would become the MEAC champs with a record of 11 and 1. Their only conference loss came earlier in the year. Bethune Cookman lost to Howard. No, not Howard. Hampton. Hampton, I'm sorry. Hampton, Hampton University. Got hurt. And there's Buddy Pugh. Congratulations to him. His team increases their record to seven and six, five and three overall. While the Aggies fall to four and eight, two and six in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. 26 to nine, the final score here from the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. Buddy Pugh is with our Nicole Watson. All right, Coach, congratulations on the win. You talked about having a more balanced attack. You were able to get it done despite the turnovers and the interceptions. Well, you know, when you when you look at five turnovers, five interceptions, you know, you can't figure out how you win the football game, but our guys made some plays. Our defense played great and uh, kept us at all the screw-ups that we had offensively. We straightened out with a great defense, so I'm, I'm proud, excited, and happy that we won our seventh game. What did you tell the guys at halftime? I, I just told them that we had to get more consistent offensively. We had to find some things that would help them. And I knew we had to throw the football around a little bit more. I had gotten a little bit too conservative, and uh, I think it, it, it helped us a bunch. As this season comes so close for you, your first year, can you give yourself an, an assessment? Yeah, C minus. Yeah, we were seven wins. It, heck, we had six wins four games ago. You know, it's you know it's a little bit tough in the fact that you know, we got our fans all excited about thinking we could play really well. And then at the end, we didn't play very well, but I'm glad we got the seven wins.
game because I really didn't want to finish 6-6. Six and six. Right, You end on a winning note, and if it's any consolation, Coach Jeffrey says you're the man they're looking for you in the future. I thank you. He, he, he is the man, and I'm just trying to do the best I can to keep it going. All right, congratulations to Appreciate you. It. They head north with the win, Charlie. Jay, back to you. Well, thank you very much, and congratulations to Coach Buddy Pugh in his first year, and congratulations to all the first-year head coaches in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, also Coach Hill Ely up at Morgan State and Coach Ray Petty at Howard University. Our Office Depot MVPs of the game, Jamie Scott from South Carolina State, nine rushes, 68 yards, and a pair of touchdowns for the Aggies of North Carolina a &T. The kicker, Yannick Matthews, he had nine points, punts that averaged 38 yards a punt and a 48 uh, yarder for his longest punt of the day, and he hit three field goals, two from 35 yards out and one from 42, and that accounted for all the scoring for the Aggies this afternoon. Yeah, both of these players did what they were supposed to do. The kicker for AT, he kept his team in the ball game. He was perfect all day. That's all you want your kicker to do. And then your short yardage running back, and Scott got the ball in the end zone. You bring him in there for situational carries, he punched it in the end zone. He did his job. That's why they got an MVP type performance. And down on the field with Nicole now is the quarterback of record, Mr. Five Interceptions himself, Reese McCampbell. <laughs> That's okay, Charlie. It's hard when you're just 15 minutes away as the crow flies east of here. He's from Lithonia, Georgia. And, you know, hometown crowd, the playing field of one of your heroes, Michael Vick. I know a lot of pressure for you today. Yeah, I, I came. I started out real. I was kind of intense, kind of hyped, too hyped for the first half. Came out, played a bad half. Like, I really played. I wasn't playing myself. But I came back second half. had to redeem myself, be calm, and come out and make play like I usually been doing all season. Your hat's got to go off to your defense. They stepped up big for you as well. Yeah, I, I told my defense, just hanging out with me. I'm come out second half, make plays. As long as they keep making plays for us to get us on the field, we're going to make plays and make uh, put points on the board. Now, Coach McNeil told me he took away your cell phone. Did that help or hurt? Yeah, he <laughs> took away my cell phone because early in the week I had gotten in a little trouble with the other case and everything. And, uh, he took my cell phone away, get my mind off everything, and get ready for the game today. All right, well, you come up with the win nonetheless, okay? Congratulations Thanks. to you. All right, let's go back upstairs. All right, out of his four or five interceptions, four did occur in the first half, so he did uh, rectify whatever problems he was having in the second half. Don't forget, coming up right after our game here at 8 o'clock Eastern, we'll take you to basketball action in Raleigh, North Carolina. Shaw Bears against Claflin College, followed by the Capital City Classic from Jackson, Mississippi, Alcorn, and Jackson State. And as we wrap up this 2002 black college football season here on NBC, I want to take a moment to say how much I've thoroughly enjoyed this season and all the thrills and excitement that made the telecast something special. I want to thank my sidekick Jay Walker for being the consummate professional, putting up with me for 12 weeks. I also want to thank our sideline reporter Nicole Watson for getting the behind the scenes look at each game. I also want to thank the producers, directors, all the technicians who do a thankless job every week to make sure you, the viewing audience, get the best picture sound in the industry. Without them, Jay, Nicole, and myself could not do our job. Also have to thank the sports information directors at the schools, the athletic directors at the schools, and mostly thank the coaches and players who allow us to eavesdrop on their practices, huddles, and who give me every reason in the world to want to do this for another 22 years. <laughs> and lastly, I want to thank NBC CEO Willie Gary, a man with a vision, and without him, this unprecedented 26-game telecast, the first in the history of black college athletics, would not be possible. For Nicole Watson, Jay Walker, and all of us here at NBC Sports, Charlie Neal saying so long. Washington State University.